surplus generation is a by product which will happen automatically and i don't know how many of you are aware we go to temple thinking that you know we are uh, worshiping something and all that if you go back to the history those were actually the incubation centers what does the temples used to do in the past they used to heal they used to preach they used to teach and they used to finance that is why all the wealthy people they have their surpluses used to be stashed in the temples and they used to help the deprived class or the enterprising class to generate that's why you have so much of business in the name of temples but we have come out of that so it's high time that we go back to our roots and as i don't know how many of you have gone through the punchline of our institute it says vidya dadati vinayam that's only the first stanza the complete thing is vidya dadati vinayam vinayam dadati patratvam patratvam praptoti artham arthena karoti dharmam so that is what the philosophy of this country is that if you are knowledgeable you will be humble if you are humble you will be recognized and you will create wealth and by creating that wealth you will do welfare of the society dharma is a very wrong word religion is not the actual english word for dharma please understand that religion is a belief system but dharma it's dharati iti dharma a person who includes other who is inclusive he is dharmic not a person who goes to the temple and uh, so wealth creation is the biggest dharma like sl kirloskar always used to say that economic preparedness of a country is as good as military preparedness or even better than that because if you are making your country economically stable if your country is creating wealth at a good pace nothing else will be a problem so with that i welcome uh, today's guest my mentor charudat sir uh, he will engage you for next one hour one and a half hour whatever it is and uh, before that i would like uh, us to read his profile all right thank you i request suhas to introduce uh, charudat sir to us A very good morning to one and all. I would like to in introduce our top speaker. He is an author, TED speaker, economist, and he is none other than Charu Dutta Panigrahi. He is a thinker. He writes politically and an influential policy expert of India in development and sustainability. A business school alumnus and a known futurist. He has been responsible for pioneering technology for good social entre entrepreneurship and sustainability in various geographies of India. an institutional builder charudatta has set up non profit think tanks and implementing platform which have so far affected the lives of over a million people from low income marginalized communities he is currently advocating for responsible mining in the and industrial growth and gross happiness index and economic social and environmental responsibilities of business he thought of leadership among the civil society also fidr the non profit think tank of national report was founded by charudatta panigrahi in the late 90s alumnus of harvard university columbia university cork university iit iim and uk educationist institute of the board of fidr he is the founder mentor of goa livelihoods forum so far he has published more than four books and many policies papers and sector briefs charudatta is a pass out from the first batch of exim and after serving in international organization like di dfid USAID HPI PwC he is presently involved in the health sector policy development initiatives in Latin America countries Africa and South Asia he is a regular speaker nationally and international and is known for his high bro articulation and pragmatic guidance he practices what he preaches he lives between gurgaon odisha and goa with his family thank you thank you for coming here sir thank you so much sir thank you so much uh it's been 6 months that we are trying to uh, communicate with you get you here sir and finally i think we are all ears and eyes over to you sir but i wasn't so difficult in 6 months sir <laughs> and i wasn't so difficult for 6 months yeah. 
So thanks, thanks. Everything at the right time, I suppose, sir. Thank Over you, to you, sir. Director, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, there was some delay. Apologies. Hello. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll put it up. Yeah. Is this better? In any case, you can hear me. So, so once again, apologies for the delay. It was the so they always you know blame it on the traffic, but this time it was not traffic. We started and took its normal course of time. So we reached here. I actually wanted to talk to all of you, spend some quality time here. That's why when the director mentioned that it could be one hour, it could be one and a half hours. Uh, it means that I will take a lot of time in interacting with in interacting with you. So, there are a few ground rules. If somebody can help me uh, coordinate with my slides, then I have a request. If you allow me, I need to kind of circulate amongst you. I just can't stand in one place and talk. That's a it's okay. Okay. So no, we are we are. I mean. So I'm here to talk about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial mindset. And why are we talking about it? Can you can you all hear me properly, clearly? And why are we talking about it? Why am I here? Very basics. Uh, let me start off from that. I am here because I have been trying to develop entrepreneurship and trying to talk to people across India and in other countries also in understanding why we should have entrepreneurship. What is this entrepreneurship that everybody talks about these days? And it's become a byword. When everybody across the country talk about entrepreneurship, there must be something about it. But what is that? So to understand that, I would be sharing a few thoughts from my experience, less bookish, more experiential. That's the first tenet of my talk today. It will be all from experience. What has happened? What has happened with me or people I know with them? or what has not happened, what has been the learning processes. So, I will be talking more about the experiences. And the other part is I will be engaging all of you. So, I have a, I have circulated probably you have already got a few case studies. So, we will talk about that. We will talk about that and what do we do. So, we, I would ideally like to divide this group into three or four subgroups, smaller groups and we will have a thinking session where I would at the end of the session. Uh, expect one from the group, each group to come and present and share their thoughts about a few questions we will have for these groups. That is the whole idea of my session. And uh, so, the first thing, yes. these are the ground rules. Please read them, then I will explain you. Right? Do not assume, do not expect that I am here to teach. So, I will not give you any chance to catch a wink. You cannot doze. Right? So, that is the first ground rule. Second is no books in here. It is all experiential. It is all sweat that has gone in. Who has done what? Who has not done what? Who has tried to do something and not achieved something? So, what is this in there for all of us to learn and imbibe? in our day-to-day -day life. And why are we talking about all this? Why are we talking about entrepreneurship today? It is not only because we have to talk about it for one and a half hours and then forget about it, but we have to understand what is the meaning of entrepreneurship for all of us and for the country. So, I will take you back to a bit of history, to a bit of geography, to a bit of politics, to a bit of everything actually to understand where we are today and simplify as much as possible. No jargons, no big words, no confusion. 
let's simplify talk in simple manner why are we talking about entrepreneurship and what is this entrepreneurial mindset um, I don't know whether you have already thought about it many years ago land was very important for all of us whoever had more land was the landlord or the aristocracy and who had less land was the less privileged then came machines whichever country had machines were the developed ones whichever com com countries didn't have the machines were the lesser developed ones or the underdeveloped ones or the developing ones now is the time when we have data whoever has more data is the data lord so from landlord to data so from a distance to as close as possible to a individual is the journey now in the last about two centuries we have traveled this just think about it now a time has come when we are looking at biometrics what does that mean that means that you are into my system you are now hacking humans that's the future you are now engineering my thoughts you want to know what i think how i think what should i think so from a distance to the individual is the journey now and we have to be prepared for the next phase what is that next phase that it's the combination of biology and technology so information technology gave you the data now biology will give you the my data the individual's data so you are now getting into the system you are getting into a human reengineering kind of a situation and this is very very crucial please think about it this is very crucial now you must have all realized by now that with our biometrics you can know what works in my brain what's my likes what are my dislikes what i should do i think everybody can track everything now you are completely trackable you are completely uh, understandable you are completely going forward also manageable i am not saying manipulative or or manipulate table i am saying manageable because manipulation is a negative word i'll i'll not take that to a negative connotation or a negative discussion i would keep for our discussion today entrepreneurial mindset i would keep this at a stage where going forward we would all be desire to do something ask to do something or made to do something in a positive way now let's park this for some time what i just told you let's park this for some time what is the other scenario the other scenario is now india is poised for a very very interesting global role going forward now with all these things happening all around us you know what i mean there are two three things very very important very crucial very significant things happening all around us one is the attack of the microbes covid covid 1 covid variant 1 covid variant 2 covid variant 3 so there will be attack of microbes microorganisms that will be that will be the new norm that will be the new normal and we have to learn to live with that what is the other thing the other thing is the geopolitical scenario so we have conflicts we have new powers coming up we have new countries in indian subcontinent facing disaster not new countries facing disaster you know what's happening in sri lanka you know what is happening with a few concentrated powers trying to continue with the concentrative approach or the approach of the erstwhile you know regimes where you take in uh, fiscal measures which you don't know how to handle you do everything but you don't know how to handle you don't know how to create a market you don't know how to create your own products and services that's where our role comes in that's where india would be a very important platform country power in the next few years if not months that's where we are discussing about entrepreneurial mindset i wanted to tell you this so that we lay the context we don't we are not doing this for one and a half hours and then forget about it and then say okay this was a part of a course and we'll get some marks or 
you know, this was this program on a Saturday morning and we came and somebody came and discussed and then vanished. No, this is a very, very important, significant thing that we are discussing. Now, if we don't develop our goods and services, we would not know where to go. We are talking about how many, how much foreign exchange reserve we have. But what's the future? What do we do with this foreign exchange reserve? How do we get the reserves? What happens to our goods and services? If we don't create goods and services, if we don't create that entrepreneurial mindset, then India as a power, economic power, a geopolitical power, will be reduced in stature and no, none of us want to make this happen. None of us want this to happen. Why I am saying this is because recently in December um, we were felicitated for, I am kind of getting onto only this, there are many other things that I want to discuss with you. So the whole point is that we have to have that skill that understanding and that hand holding. Now coming to that, it is not always that entrepreneurial mindset can be taught. Many say that it is not taught. Either you come with that instinct or you do not come with that instinct. How to do business? You know, business does not come naturally to everyone. I would say, the why are we discussing about all this today? Why do we have entrepreneurial discussions across the country? Is because the budding entrepreneurs or the prospective entrepreneurs need to know the market situation, need to know the rudiments of entrepreneurship, which means I might have a bright idea, I might not know where to go on this. I might have a brilliant idea, but that idea has to match with the requirements of the entire ecosystem. If it does not match, then my idea will stay with me. It can be a good idea, but it will not be sustainable. This is where I want to spend the next one, one, one and a half minutes on sustainability. Of course, I have another session on ESG, but that will talk more about sustainability. But here I am talking about business sustainability. So unless the business sustains, which means that there is a progressive outcome of the business year on year, the entrepreneur will or does always lose heart and they get demotivated. And that is where we have to give them the kind of necessary boost in un not only better understanding but also better deployment of resources. So by that what I mean is there are many ways of doing other. It is not only about self-help groups or not only about rural economy. It is also about our young economy, our creative economy. Maybe you can be a, you can think of making a good film. You can think of having a good music studio. You can think of anything, you can think of art, you can think of sculpture. Everything has to be backed by, I, I, I sincerely believe in this, has to be backed by a solid plan. Now to have that plan, it is not always feasible, busy, uh, you know, uh, desirable for an uh, outsider advisor to come in and do the plan for you without that, you know, complete uh, transfer of knowledge, transfer of skills and all of that happening without the empowerment of the other person, without the capacity building. If I, if, if it comes in as a parachute, as an as a external force that can happen to help the producers get to a particular level, but after that what? After that they have to manage their own business. This is where comes the role of the entrepreneurs that we are talking about in B schools, for example KIMS. Now why are we talking about KIMS in uh, entrepreneurship in this institute is because students here or the um, executives who come for executive development programs or we must be having PDPs and MDPs, management development programs. When they come in here, they have to have a repository. So I would strongly urge KIMS to have some kind of a think tank, entrepreneurial or entrepreneurship center or a think tank. Yeah, something like an incubation center. I am calling it a kind of thing. Why I am saying is because, yes, why I am saying is because this needs constant growth. Now, constant growth comes from a sustained effort. One or two successions will not make entrepreneurs. It's, it's, it's hard work. Entrepreneurship is hard work. 
let's understand that. We can have technology, but technology is just a tool. Technology is a tool. Let's not forget that. So we can have multiplier effects with technology, but what is that you're going to multiply is something you need to understand. So having a baseline, what is this business you want to do? Why you want to do? What is the need, needs assessment? What are the market forces already in play? So all that you study in marketing in Kotler and all that, 5 P's and 6 P's and all of that, I'm not getting into jargon, but I'm, I'll tell you the basics. All that has to play. But where is that time and where is that uh, energy that enables you to do this? That is why this cell. This cell should be dedicated. And I was, I got this question when I was talking about national education policy. Probably for the first time, we have this approach of the entire country being led more towards freedom in education. So while I am doing this course, I think I need to drop off. I need to take off for a year. I want to try out something. I want to try out in a new ICT, Information and Communication Tools. I want to try out with a new app. Or I want to try out with a completely new thing. I can take that off. I can do that and again come back and join. And there is a lot of scope for seniors, experienced people, mentors to come not necessarily with a formal PhD kind of a thing, but more with an experiential uh, knowledge, more with experience. So these are the kind of, there are many other things, but I'm just giving you a flavor of the national education policy. These are the things which are very progressive. This has happened for the first time. Let's take advantage of this. Let's first talk to the young minds about what is this education system that we are talking about today, what it means for you, where you can take time off and what you can do logically and practically to improve your career and also to have your income. Because unless there is income from a business, from an uh, enterprise, um, as, as the director mentioned, it need not be a profit surplus but it has to be a, a system or be a, be a uh, environment where you are creating wealth. So, with, so what does that mean? Practically what does that mean? That means that if you do something, it has to have a cascading effect. So if I do a little, if I open a little enterprise, a small enterprise, but if I do that, that's why you would realize have you ever thought why technology has become so successful? Talking about technology for the last 100 years. Absolutely. 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 So, it, so someone is saying mass appeal, someone mass support, mass appeal, mass effect. Somebody is saying uh, make things easier. So, we are, we are wired in such a way, our brains are wired in such a way that we will always look for solutions which are smart. Now if by doing this, I am only not only talking about IT, I am talking about all kinds of technology but I am taking the example of reality. If by doing this I reach out to you faster and have your services as a hailing cab or as a food joint or as a film review or something like that, then it makes things faster for more people. So the scale is something which is very important. So whatever we do, if we could reach out to more people, we could we could influence, affect, touch more lives. That's why you would have noticed when he, when he read out this thing, he said that our work has touched so many lives. Now I always lay a lot of importance on the work, what is its effect on people on everyday day to day life. If that doesn't happen, if 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 the entrepreneurship is not looking at a democratic involvement of more and more, more and more people, then we again go back to the concentrative system of uh, uh, data land uh, lord or handling of all the parts. So initially you had two or three car manufacturers giving you cars in the country. Now you have these many manufacturers giving car in the country. Now out of these manufacturers, again they have come down to this because we are looking at EVs. Now from EVs specialized, again they will become like this. What's the future? Have you think about it. 
always be be a little futuristic why are we doing what we are doing today why am i talking to you about all this today because again let me repeat that at the end of this session if we have three people interested i'm not even looking at 30 three people interested in having a entrepreneurship cell here having a regular discussion here offline online it doesn't bother matter having three people four people getting support from the center and establishing something at least ideating in paper these are the concrete tangible outcomes that i'm looking at out of this session and i've also mentioned about this outside also yeah okay so that could be the geography so i'm not saying only so so kims can have this center the incubation center or the or the think tank that could help the entire region you you are from different organizations institutions so that can help the entire region it's not specific to any particular area but if you are holding this in a house in this in a house it here that's the whole approach so let me let me go forward I can, uh, in the process we can go on talking about different other things uh when typically we start we start doing something first thing that comes to a it's reducing but first thing that comes is dreams are dreams don't dream much nothing will happen out of dreams this is the typical you know backlash or the typical response that you would get from the ecosystem dreams cannot be you know they are dreams they are far away they are esoteric they are not here to uh, you know touch you and touch me it's good to talk about dreams but tell me how much you got in your first semester no if it is below 98% no you know good because what are the marks so so if if i say no no marks are not important but i wanted to open a matchbox factory now what is this why why are you doing all this that's because it's not a dig at the response that we have from the ecosystem it it is actually a learning process which means we might be talking in 60 in a group of 30 or 40 but the dissemination doesn't happen in bigger concentrated circles if the dissemination would happen faster more people would join the bandwagon we are not doing that maybe i am not telling it to my brother maybe i am not telling it to my peers maybe we are not discussing much and we are discussing in small groups this has happened this has happened and i am standing in front of you i was told this don't dream dreams don't happen and what is the point you have done this from b school why don't you go to this country it's very you know comfortable life why do you have to for everything you have to have a long queue for everything there is a struggle from school admission to train ticket to flight ticket to everything is a uh, struggle here why do you why do you waste your time but if you tell them at that point in time you know i want to contribute to the national gdp imagine the discussion so the other side will think either you are talking too high you are trying to you know kind of put everything up in the air saying that oh you only you you can contribute to the national gdp no i want to contribute to the state gdp i want to contribute to the district gdp this is my contribution imagine the discussion so i'll tell you why i'm sharing all this big picture is a pipe dream don't give me that big picture tell me how much you'll get at the end of the month that's what matters to me these are the typical responses uh polymaths are gas bags oh um okay i now know how to make an app no no i was also thinking about cement industry why they are uh, getting limestone from that particular forest and i want to do something to raise activism on forest degradation no no i want to do something in uh, tap water uh, availability of good drinking water in my city why are you thinking about these 30 things so so the response is why are you thinking about these 30 things why don't you focus concentrate on one uh, idea now tell me something very frankly each one of you i'm asking you a very candid question don't we think about 10 things as human beings don't we think about 10 things is it wrong to think about 10 things if out of thinking from 
from a from a whole universe you get to funnel three things out of those three things you think one thing is feasible that's how everything works that's how we are taught that's how we are taught that this is the universe you funnel your thoughts to one or two but if i actually do this and tell you no no i am worried about the water system helicopters are not working properly the um, uh, mineral industry is completely dooming our uh, country but this is the what is the seas from mineral to mines to industries to helicopter what is this guy saying so there has to be room for thinking again i am harping on this that you need to pack exactly as an incubation center incubation center having these many schemes of the government you take this desk you will be paid this much and you have this idea i'll give you per month this much for one year as operational expenses out of this you do this develop this then i'll help you in marketing this idea that's so late that's that's given that's that what the incubation center has to do but what is that where are you helping me in my mindset where are you helping me in my behavioral approach so that is the germination center that is the importance of what we are discussing the schemes are all in the website i if i try to talk to you about schemes here you say why are you saying on this what is this new thing that you are telling me it will take 2 minutes for all of these guys to get them from the download them from the website so small is beautiful need not necessarily you say start small we always start small i agree with that we always start small but at the same time if we don't have the big picture if we don't have link of this small idea with the big picture it will never work it doesn't work so why are you thinking about you know taking uh, reviews why are you thinking about having some 10000 restaurants in bangalore on your app what will you do can you reach out to them we have this talk today now uh, why are you talking about uh hailing uh, helicopters uh, these uh, aero you know health uh, ambulances air ambulances who will why are you uh, hiring ambulances will this business run will this work uh, we still are ambulances we have better roads now national highways authority of india has made uh, excellent roads why are you making all this who will pay for this it is done so if we have the needs assessment the background work the detailed project report done properly with our own understanding not bookish don't go by what mr gates has done or mr zuckerberg has done it's good to read their biographies i also read a lot of biographies and autobiographies it's very good there is no doubt about it but how do you what you do to your own lives is also very important ಅಂಟರ್ಪ್ರಿನರ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಿನರ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಿನರ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಿನರ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಿನರ್ಸ್
and that has come from books, that has come from the curriculum. Right? That's why we have uh, either graduate or postgraduate or doing management or doing technology, also from business families. So after a basic education, you are coming to a center where you would be, what is the expectation? At the end of the day, I should be knowing how to think, what to think. Mark my words now. How to think, what to think. Second is, if I think this, then what? Third thing is, I have thought, you have told me, I have thought, where do I go from here? The, the basic questions which we have tried, I have tried to, me and my team, we have tried to nurture some young talents. Now, when I am saying young talents, there is no, uh, no fixed mindset that uh, anybody who walks in is not talented. The mindset is that everybody is born with the same talent, with the same IQ, with the same understanding. It all depends on how I handle it. And that is the essence of your question. How do we nurture that? So the first thing is, how do you disseminate, how do you share ideas with the team? So all of us here today want to do something on our own. That's the first premise. Now, if I do want to do something on our own, I'll ask all 50 of you, what is your thought? You must have thought something. Everyone thinks. It is the duty of us as the first part of nurturing to collate all the ideas and put them. So there will be a laundry list. So 50 ideas, there might be 50 very diverse different ideas or 50 might, if you, if you kind of match them, they will come down to 25 or 20. No, I'm not. I'm not even calling Winston Hamsters because that again comes with a kind of a stereotype. So I'll, I'll not call them because I'll tell you something. Uh, that is what we have suffered. That is what. Whenever you say something, oh no no, you fancy this will happen. No no, I don't fancy. I aspire. There's a big difference between that. So first is a laundry list. Second is the funnel that you prepare. So 20 or 25, then it is the work of the of the center or you or me to kind of do a detailed research on each one of them. That is the nurturing that they require. Otherwise, everything is there in the website. If you now go to this thing, how to make a aeroplane also, there is everything in uh, YouTube. But you can't make the aeroplane there. Now, I'll give an example. In Andhra Pradesh, there's this person who wanted to he is a farmer. He wanted to have a drone. Now, he had heard about the drone. His problem was high labor cost, unavailability of labor. These days, laborers also uh, would come with a lot of uh, difficulty and the pricing is also very expensive and all of that. So, he had a patch of about 10 acres, a small to medium kind of a farmer. 10 acres and he wanted to, so he needed people. He needed somebody to tend to this. So what happens is you, so paddy for paddy, you have to uh, put uh, fertilizer quite regularly and in a manner where row by, so row by row you have to, so you need more people. This takes a lot of time and due to erratic rain and erratic non-rain, what happens is this field needs sometimes water and sometimes gets dry. So it's very erratic. Sometimes you need people, sometimes you don't need people. If you don't take people on a kind of a contract basis, they don't come. So I have to hire this person for six months or three months. If I even if I don't have work, so all this was making his business very, uh, you know, uh, undependable and erratic. So he thought of a system by which I would not, I, I can do away with people, I will do something for better distribution of fertilizers, for better seeds and better water. Okay. Believe me, he went to YouTube. Someone told him, go to YouTube, there is something called YouTube. In his phone, he went to YouTube. He learned making drones from the YouTube. Took seven months to do that. He had the first drone. It failed. There was some problem, it failed. Again it so after one year he made the first drone. Today, in the last three to four years, he has been renting out drones to other states also, Rajasthan, UP and all of that. So what happened was, how did we nurture his idea? What did we tell him? 
first time when he asked what is this drone, we told him that like, drone is this thing, drone will fly, drone will give you water, it can do everything, it depends on the payload and this is your expense. So what he did was he had some money and we actually funded him, we supported him. So and then we supported him and told him but I am not saying giving money is the only way you have nurtured them, no, By this is handled. By telling him that these are the difficulties, you have to approach this person, this person, this person for this. Because he is a farmer. He, he has no time to do this and he has no understanding. He did not understand also. That is our job. To, if we call ourselves intuition, what is it has been a very pedantic approach. So, I will be talking and you will be listening. It is like this. Yeah? It was never like this. Uh, if I am talking to you and you are receiving that, you can also question me and I can also question you. It was not sharing. That is why we always have this, so if I am a, so this stereotype, if I am thinking about some idea, I have to be grim faced. The, only then you will realize that I am serious about it. Why are you smiling? Why are you saying you can do this, you can do that? So things when, from a, try to understand the governance structure. When you have a license system very strong and when you try to loosen that up with technology, when more and more people are answerable and more and more people are uh, system driven, then it becomes very difficult for some people to understand that. But it will not last long. In the next three to five years, if you ask me, the rise in entrepreneurship in India would be manifold, about four or five times more. That is the way forward. But these have been the traditional things which entrepreneurs have faced and we have taken a study also, we have done a quick uh, survey of meeting uh, about 200-300 entrepreneurs um, from about 9 states, we try to ask them what are the things you, behavioral aspects, I will be more on these behavioral aspects rather than the technical aspects because technical aspects we know what to do, it is all laid out. We have no issues on that. The behavioral aspect, the support aspect is something which is so crucial to nurturing. So crucial to nurturing. I want to go to the bank. The bank has a scheme by which without collateral it is giving uh, loan. But when I am going to the bank, the bank manager does not want to look at my face. Why? Obviously, that does not come under his target because they are not taking the collateral. So who is going to, who is going to talk to the bank manager? This is where the incubation center has to come. This is where they need help. Uh, ideally, I would never like them to spend 15 days sitting outside the bank manager's office in the bench and wasting their time. Ideally not. If you ask me to think from the entrepreneur's point of view, this is a complete inefficient way of handling your time. You are not supposed to do that. If we say it is make in India, start up India, stand up India, then where is that? That is when it comes to facilitation. So the word facilitation is what I wanted to tell you under nurturing. This is facilitation. You have to facilitate him to do what he has always dreamt about. And it need not be some 30,000 feet dream. It can be a very simple thing also. And no entrepreneur or no enterprise is big or small. It's all today. It was earlier. As I was mentioning to you, we had first land then we had machines, then we had data. If you have more data, you are a bigger data lord. You can manipulate. If I have less data, then I am weaker. But today, it is more of a flat world, getting flatter. It is not an ideal flat world even today. We still have our own issues, but it is heading towards that. So this is the time when we have to gear the, the entrepreneurs into that. This is again the third point of nurturing. This is concrete nurturing. Otherwise, everything is there in the web. agriculture products like they are providing the GIE tag for many products and government also help them to create FPOs, farm as organizations and also they are providing some monetary benefits but still uh, farmers are not uh, manipulating check, check. utilizing check. utilizing properties that's exactly what I was telling you on one hand you have 50 schemes so the the budget of 
what you are saying, uh, rural livelihoods mission, there is a rural livelihoods mission program, it is around more than 50,000 crores. This much of money is here. Okay. There lie the entire farmer groups, so many thousand million farmer groups in India. From there they have to come here to take the money or the money has to go to them. Who will take that? No, who will take that? NGOs are handling That is one. So, NGO, government, others. In others, now, there is a role for all of us to play. That is why I am talking about this agriculture. If we don't do this, so, so how do you do this? Big basket will say that you have five quintals, you are not able to sell, you give it to me. And I ask this 50,000 from this city, this much of money should go to that group so that they can produce potatoes so that I can buy them and I can sell them. So this kind of a link has to be established. Now the job of this is either the government, the non-government or all of us entrepreneurs. So answering your question, it has to be taken up at the entrepreneurship level because Government has a system. Again, I am saying, who will utilize the system? How do you know what exists? We have to do that. Yes, sir. You wanted to ask something? Yeah. yeah. Can we go to the... Yes. You can't read. So, this is just... I wanted to give the uh, definition of what is this mindset that we are talking about, the entrepreneurial mindset. And I will just read it out because it is not visible. An entrepreneurial mindset is a set of skills and aptitude that enable people to identify and make the most of opportunities, overcome and learn from setbacks and succeed in a variety of settings. Now please see the highlighted words. The highlighted words are the key to all that we discussed in the last 15-20 minutes. I need not repeat that, but I would like to mention something here about the variety of settings. That's what I was hinting at him, I, I was telling him, I was hinting at, uh, variety of settings. India, due to its sheer size, is a complex system, complex country. We have many sets of players because of the size of our um, you know, country, states, size of our system. So, when you have variety of settings, the entrepreneur need to understand the settings and the handholding, the incubation, the nurturing, the, the center, the platform which is supposed to support the entrepreneurial mindset needs to have this facilitated for him or her or for the group. If it doesn't happen, the same thing will continue. So, we will keep on harping on the difficulties on the ground and we will keep on saying that this doesn't reach me. India's welfare schemes for information is probably one of the best in the world today. But you would argue with me, does all the welfare reach everyone required? Some of the welfare schemes, are they actually required or are they given for some other purpose? So, all these are there, all these exist. But with that, if we don't facilitate, then there is no point in calling ourselves having the entrepreneurial mindset, we don't have it. And one of the first and foremost things of entrepreneurial mindset is the positivity. And I am not asking you to be unnecessarily optimistic. But at the same time, I am also requesting all of you, the entrepreneurs here or the mentors of entrepreneurs here to have a view where things can happen. Otherwise, right from day one you have failed. If you think, no, no, I cannot make it, the system will not allow to make it, then you are finished. Then why think about it? Drop the idea. There is no point in thinking about it. In spite of all this, we have to do this. In spite of all this, we have done this. Today, if we are talking about entrepreneurship in this country, we have done it. 
it might not be to the degree we desire because of various issues because we have to understand the issues how many of you have ever visited a collector's office so in the class of 50 five hands i can see five hands so 10% of visited collector's office i'm just giving an example i'm digressing have you ever seen how the collector's office uh, functions is there enough people there to understand the schemes there are some conservative i'm saying there are some under a collector's office in a typical mid sized district not less than about 89 to 93 kind of schemes important schemes under which development can happen there is one person there are about two to three people under him and there are about about 30 people under him i'm talking about the department heads and deputies i'm not talking about the workers there is huge band of asha workers anganwadi workers all of them are there but they will do what comes down so imagine 89 90 schemes about 100 schemes managed by three or four people with that kind of and they are not there only for the schemes there are many other work that they do other than the schemes day to day work law and order situation revenue work litigations all kinds of work for everything you run to the collector's office in a district so where is the capacity so we also need to understand the capacity now so what is the situation what is the solution then we all talk about it what is the solution the solution is the students from this institute and from your institutes if they can do a fellowship with the collector's office six months fellowship we have tried this in many places one year fellowship what will they do they will be there in the collector's office to write proposals where they can understand the schemes better many schemes lapse because the district cannot write proposals to the state and the state cannot write proposals to the center that's why the money gets lapsed to civil deposit accounts 31st march if you can't spend that money first april it goes back now what it means that we have to enlarge our, we have to broaden our vision on how we can a b school churn out a b school student will not only do some um, you know accounting and statistics management marketing uh, it um, ob behavioral science and then go away and join some organization then say that no no nothing is happening who will make it happen who will make it happen you have to make it happen now if you think that you have necessary skills added skills more skills do it then do it then and then help your people who are uh, entrepreneurs or who want to have enterprises and tell them that these are the issues so do it it works try it out once see for yourself it works you can mitigate the risks that is the essence of entrepreneurship risk taking and risk mitigation how much risk you want to take and how much risk you can mitigate if you work smartly this is the smart work per district in india for about 400 or population there is one ngo so there are more ngos than primary health centers and schools have you ever asked one of the ngos in your area isn't it your work your responsibility to help me do get some benefit under some scheme from that particular office what are you doing please do it we haven't done that so i'm not in a position to say that whether they are doing it or not no i'll not make a value judgment here but i haven't done that the first finger should point out to me i haven't done that to the youngsters i'm saying you're spending so much of time on social media raise some issues around this area talk about whatever issues are there water issues pollution issues air issues see whether it happens or not if it doesn't happen then it makes sense for all of us to discuss and say that the ecosystem doesn't help enterprises ecosystem doesn't help an entrepreneur this is the nurturing 
that the holistic nursing, the 360 nursing that I'm talking to about, there are many elements. Yeah. So we have to we have to understand our roles and responsibilities also. So what are the characteristics? Some of the characteristics I have mentioned here. Decisiveness, confidence, accountability, resilience, humility. Now I haven't just copied them from any book to give you in this slide, but I mean each each word. Say decisiveness. Today I decide on making a fountain pen uh, production center. Tomorrow I decide on making some sweets. No? So this this kind of vacillation, this kind of not being able to focus on one or two areas where I can give my energy is quite natural. Don't think it is on. It happens to everyone. That is where session like this or people like us should be able to help them. What I mentioned earlier, funnel those. Have a SWOT analysis. What is your strength? What is your weakness? What are the opportunities? What is the threat? Can you do it? Can you not do it? So this kind of an assessment has to be done very minutely detailed. It's not like filling up a form when you apply for a loan of the bank. What is your worth? What is this? So how much of collateral you can give? So we can give you this much of loan. This is all there in the form. We want to dig deeper into that person's life or that company's life about what they intend to do and whether that can be done or not. If that can be done, another area of uh, very important uh, you know, understanding is that we have enough VCs, venture capitalists and private equity firms and even angel investors who are willing to support. When I am saying enough, I actually mean enough. But we don't get those kind of proposals. If he is doing an app, I will also do the same app. He will also do the same app. That's not being decisive. You have to understand what is unique to your thinking, your approach. Don't do this because it has worked. While Ola has worked, I will also put Kola, then you will put Gola, then somebody will put Mola. That, that doesn't make sense. That, don't, don't have that herd mentality. If you think it will work, please, I mean, if, if your assessment says that it will work, feel free to do that. Otherwise, please do something else. Confidence, I have already mentioned to you, have confidence in you. People will say, some people will support you, some people will ask you uncomfortable questions, some people will try to always, you know, no, no, it will not happen. There are lots of people, lots of them. In our own families also, you have different kinds of people. Our siblings are different from us. So there will be people like that. But if you are, you know what you are doing, you will get to them. I did my... Uh, B school then after that uh, first so there was a time when um, you know I said that um, no I have to reach out to people my issue here was that if I get into a job I'll probably reach to 50 people 60 people 500 vendors this much but if I go to civil society set up a civil society organization and work in the uh, communities I'll probably reach to this number Scale was something always, it made me very heady. I was very, uh, you know, scale-centric uh, person. So when I mentioned this to somebody, then, then what are you, why are you doing this? You've got such a cushy job. Why do you want to quit all this and do all that? Now, how do I, so on one hand, I can explain to you the metrics. If I put in, so I always use the analogy of hydraulic brakes. If you put in X pressure here, the other side should give you 10X or 15X. If you are spending 100 rupees, the result should be some 1000 rupees or 2000 rupees. Even, so that's a typical, you know, you know, investor's mentality. Now, so I wanted to do something where I can reach to so many people and do something drastic. Now, how do you do that? Now, how do you reach to those many people? So I developed a civil society, I established a civil society organization. I said, let's go and reach out to people. They said, how will you reach out to people like this? Who will come to you? And where will you, how will you do? Suppose I go to a village, where do I get 10 rupees to spend for tea? Or how do I spend money for fuel? I have to put petrol to go to that village. And then I realized that, look, I can give this idea 
to some tech company and tell them that look if you support me in that particular village I can train 10 people on technology. I can tell them what technology is. I will not give them any instrument or device that they can get from the market. But I tell them that technology is important for your lives. A very simple straight message. I am talking to you about 23 years ago, 24 years ago. When all this was not there and WhatsApp was not there, Facebook was just coming in. You had those big handsets, Nokia and all those handsets, still remember. So, and they immediately said, okay, this, this proposal we had never got, this kind of a proposal, let's go ahead and do that. From one center, in one year, we had about 50 to 53 centers, all supported by them. What was the outcome? Outcome was, I had at least 2000 people knowing what technology can do to their life, at least believing in technology. I am not a blind advocate of technology, mind you, but believing in technology that in some areas like farming, livestock, dairy, these are the three or four areas where we work, where technology can support us, can help us, very simple straight technology and that was supported. From then on, we started, now we are in 10 states and we are recognized for our work in Atman Bharat, this, that, all those things. How did this happen? This happened because sheer uh, dedication, sheer perseverance. At it, at it, it's hard work. It's not easy. At it. And all these stories are fine. They were always guiding us. Biographies, autobiographies of people who made it. But we learned a lot from them. And humility is one thing that has always worked. At least in areas where I have gone and uh, reached out to the community, humility works. Typically you would see there is a tendency of non-government organizations when they go to the community, they will talk to you in a language where it will come out very clearly that I know everything, you don't know anything. Now that itself breaks the uh, communication, it breaks, it breaks down. So what he will do, whatever I say, he will just nod, he will say yes without registering anything. So internalization of whatever happens, development happens to oneself is the most important thing. Whenever you have time, please go through, uh, uh, check out on my uh, TED talk. I have given a TED talk on internalization, social courage. So why do you internalize? There are so many offers coming to people. We will, so insurance schemes, health schemes, do the people who get the schemes or the benefits understand what makes their life easy? Do so young mothers, do they know that institutional delivery means a lot to their future families? Do they understand that by institutional delivery they are avoiding all necessary avoidable health episodes like hemorrhage, like child deformation? Do they understand that? If they understand that, then the ambulatory services that you have, ambulances for pregnant mothers, they will understand that this is actually helping our future generations. By mere giving of bones, by giving him, doesn't make him understand the value of this. So how will this person understand what the GDP is, how the country is operating, why I should do this, why are we talking about doing some business, entrepreneurship, I am simplifying it. So, this, so you know what, the nurturing that you asked me, another part of nurturing is spend time with them. We don't do that. We think that it's like, you know, I, I press a button and the other person will understand and tomorrow he'll be a Mark Zuckerberg. It doesn't happen like that. It just doesn't happen like that. We have to spend time, concentrate, it's hard work. Next one. This is what I have already mentioned, innovative thinking, doing for innovation, always learning, flexibility and no giving up. I just mentioned to you. I just want to tell you something about the tenacity, never giving up. Don't give up. That's, that's something we have to tell them how not to give up. And that's a very difficult individual thing. That's a very individual thing. What? I might get uh, tired very easily, you might not. Oh, this is not working, I have to run to 50 places. Uh, suppose I am a doctor, I am in private practice. I want to reach out to the entire district. 
how will I reach out? If I reach out, people will say, oh, because you are doing uh, private practice, you are coming for your benefit. But actually, the doctor would like to help the people there by holding camps. Who will hold camps? Now, the doctor will hold camps with whose help? So, every primary health center has a band of ASHA workers working with them. So, they hold regular weekly health camps. Get in touch with them. They will help you in getting the health camps. Why? Because one of their targets is mobilization of people. If you don't have, uh, you know, uh, health camps which are required for the people, like dentistry, how many people in our country go for regular dental checkups? They don't. Dental checkups. They don't. So now, if if a dentist reaches out with the help of a camp, it can happen. Regular dental checkups. So the primary health center has to be told. The primary health center has a MO, medical officer. We have to understand the system. The system exists. We have to make it run. It's our responsibility. And that is the basis of entrepreneurship. This is, if you ask me, this has been the mantra. If you, if you love what you are doing, you will never get tired. You will never get tired. You might be working in a job, but while you are painting or you are writing or you are singing, you never get tired. So it's for you to choose. So right from day one, this is again a part of nurturing. How do we sit with them and identify what they love? If we don't do that, they say, oh, these are the five things you have to do. He will say, okay, they are there in the website. What extra are you telling me? So they are already there. So we, ha so it's more to do with the behavior. When you are talking about mindset, it is also the psychology. Have you realized of late that there are many art students taking up psychology? Do you guys know that in the recent budget, mental health has been allocated a separate budget for the first time in India? Do you also know that every state will now recruit mental health specialists separately? Why are we doing this? We are doing this because one, we need to strengthen mental health of this country and that involves a lot of youngsters. Why? Because India is the youngest country. More than 60 percent is below 25. So if we can't help them with their mental health, and this is what I'm talking to you about nurturing, this runs much deeper. Entrepreneurship is not 10 slides. Entrepreneurship is much deeper. We have to nurture at that level, and do that and see the magic. It happens. With this point. I would say we as faculty probably could identify what some people are good at or the other way around is I could give them maybe a series of activities that did go and probably they identify some uh, kind of a vocation in that kind of a thing. Probably both the ways it could be I identify in my student or I give them a series of activities and they, they identify themselves with one of those activities and probably they love what they do. Both the ways. Both the ways. Uh, what I had done initially was I had done a quadrant, a kind of a matrix. So, unfortunately, I didn't uh, put that in a slide. So, you do uh, draw a quadrant, and in the quadrant, you for for the right side is what you love and what you are doing. What you love, what you are not doing. What you don't love, you are not doing. What you don't do is what you love. So, so and then you plot. How many are there? So, but this is an exercise you have to do. Do you do you ever remember do you, when we were kids? This was the exercise. It was done by a class teacher. What do you like most in life? What you don't like to do? What do you do in your leisure time? These are the questions which were asked to us when we were uh, uh, kids. But our curriculum is such that the day they come, we start. We have to teach them, and then we have that at the end of the thing. We that, that's the problem with the but uh, Dr. Fanai, that's going to be reduced in the coming days because of any that has to reduce and there is no other option. See, either we have cookie cutter style, cookie cutter style, 
every year, every batch you have 30, this 40 like that, 50 like that. You think you have that which has been happening for the last 75 years? Or you make that big change. It will be disruptive. It will be disruptive initially. And you are not finishing the course. What is this enterprise you are talking about? What is this entrepreneurship? I like to show my marks to my teacher, my parents. Why are you spending money and uh, studying there in that management college? They are not giving me a certificate in time. All these questions will come. But then you have to take that bold decision and that is that is incubation. That is essentially nurturing. They like that. Sorry. Yes. Uh, sir, I am Shantika. Uh, basically, I am an advocate actually. Uh, sir, uh, what I can suggest here is uh, for the school children, as you said, what we love, what we are doing and all. Uh, it's from 1st till 10th standard, whatever they learn, probably they will not use it uh, in the further days. So, at the beginning itself, maybe around when they are in 6th, 7th, we can just divide the students there itself, like what they are interested in and we can meet them or train them from there itself so that you can add on this, choose a job that you like or else it would be like this, whatever you are doing, just love it. So there's, there's a difference, so choose a job whichever you like or I would say like uh, love the job whatever you are doing, uh, it uh, gives different meaning. So what I feel is from when itself we make divide the students. I guess uh, they can stand better and even this entrepreneurship can uh, uh, really help them then. Thanks, thanks. Uh, that was actually the practice, our Indian system of Gurukul system. Yeah, it was then, but now so, we have... I'm saying it was actually the practice. What had happened uh, in between is something let's forget I and mean, let's not go back to the past again and again. That will not solve our problems. What you are saying can be done. Some of the schools have already started doing this. I'm involved in some exercises like this. So they have started doing this. And um, I hope in the coming future uh, that will increase. So that we could we could actually you know put them into different uh, brackets of their understanding and love. And even mentorship when it comes to uh, degree students and all, even that helps them so that we can understand. As Sir said, we have such a curriculum, when to finish that and when, when to conduct the activities. Provided mentorship can help the students then. The five year course that NEP talks about, these, the national education policy, is actually aimed at this. So in the second year, I start um, liking, uh, I start uh, thinking about doing something in carpentry. So I drop off. Suppose I am taking some other course. I am interested in carpentry. I drop off. I take another course in carpentry and then I might join back, I might not join back depending on this. So the flexibility, what I am trying to tell you is that the flexibility is already getting into the system. This is, we are in a cusp. We are actually in a cusp. Are, so there is a paradigm shift now happening. This will take some time but it's all in the process of happening like that. This is where I want to um, break this into three or four groups. So we have given the case, some case studies. Take a case of your choice, any anyone. Just answer one question. What do you think were the risks of that? Or otherwise, in other words, what do you think the entrepreneur would have overcome to achieve this? So how do we do that? All ones, all twos, all threes, or uh, these two are the groups, or how do we? Uh, so in total, we have about. Uh, 30. So we could have uh, four, three groups. We could have three groups. Yeah. So three groups. So can we say um, 
10 so till u is another group, one group and uh, u another group, group 2 then 10 from the last chair and this group so 4 groups and um, I like 1 from the group to present the thoughts of the group if you can do it quickly it's about 15 minutes that should be good uh, should I repeat the question again? What are the risks associated with this uh, enterprise or entrepreneur? So make it flexible. It can be an enterprise, it can be a, the entrepreneur. And or otherwise, in other words, what has this person or this enterprise overcome to achieve what has uh, he or she achieved? So I have done some workshops for DIC, District Industry Centre. So what I observed there was that uh, generally what happens is uh, people come there for training. So it is not the person who is involved in the business but it is family member that person comes for training. So they are basically more worried about the finance part. And subsequently you said the manager he doesn't even look at these people. The reason being maybe that what happens is over a period of time. Uh, these whatever these businesses they don't run so it converts into an NP so that's one thing I observed another thing is you said this incubation center this can be done in a structured environment but whereas those people they are less educated and they just come for the purpose of finance and they come and meet us in the district industry center for a short term training so for these people there won't be such structured in incubation centers so how can this be addressed oh, first question Mm, I don't think that's a question, it's a statement you made. I agree with that. That's exactly why the bank people are a little wary of meeting people because it will lead to NPA finally and it will come to his uh, performance. Number two, uh, what has been done? I'll tell you what practically has been done. So, say group of SSGs or farmers, they are brought into institutes like this, into these incubation centers and uh, there is a special program for them. And, and what happens is, um, in many cases, some of these institutes, I am not suggesting that this should be done here, they also take it as their community outreach. Community outreach yes, would be good because like institute. what we stressed was only for the students, but if it can be done for the society also it will be good. In fact, if they come it will be better for the yes, students yes. to learn from them. They will learn from them. I always harp on practical things. Yes. You know, because that will give them an idea about what works and what doesn't. Yes. We can say many things. At the end of the day, it has to work. Yes, sir. That's something um, I would suggest if, if you are thinking of such a cell in KIMS, you should involve people from the community. Involve people from the community. Okay. And it should be more of the person coming, sir, actually. What happens? A representative comes and they do it for namesake. You know why the, yeah, they, you know. Oh, you sent her. Okay, go. This is exactly what happens. Okay, go send her. Or send her. The whole day you will sit there. They will take a bunch of papers and all these presentations and all the copies. They, they will not work that way. So, can we... Till yeah. her is one group. Right? And then... Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fernandez. Till her is one group. Case one. Case one. Case one. And then, yeah. yeah. I will give you a print now. I have a print now. And this one is case two. Starting from here, two, uh, they have gone, gone out or something. So that's group two. Yeah, please come closer. Yeah, this will be group 2. This will be group 2. Okay. Look back. And then this will be group 3. You all are here, no? You? Okay. So from here, uh, so 3 to 5. Yeah. So your group 3, or so case 3, and group 4. This is case 1, right? No, case 1, 2, 3, 4. 
Yes, four people, four.
So the continually building case was about Amazon, about Jeff Bezos. Am I right? Okay. Now, if you look at the risk associated for whatever a group could gather, we are looking at reaching out a large number of customers. Amazon began by looking at online retailing, and online retailing would mean how do you reach a large number of clients, large number of uh, customers. And uh, of course, they also were looking at tax avoidance. And that opportunity was given by the American government that you being an online retailer, you don't want to pay taxes. So that gave you an enormous amount of mileage. So uh, the risk was reaching out a large number of clients. Uh, the benefit was if you go on to online retail of uh, books, you would be able to avoid tax payment and Jeff Bezos also got one more benefit. He looked at, someone told him about predictive analytics. Predictive analytics would mean that you would be able to understand what customer wanted and their abil your ability to predict what the customer would want in future, what kind of books, what kind of, uh, you know, freakish or, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, not normally looked at books and uh, Jeff Bezos and his Amazon was able to look at take the help of predictive analytics with the help of predictive analytics they were able to satisfy customers they were able to get their outstanding loyalty and most important probably was get lifetime customer value which is a part of predictive analytics so uh, to wind up or to, uh, wrap up whatever we have discussed we have looked at uh, a risk associated with continuous uh, continuing building for Amazon and how they were able to come up, come overcome the risk. I am now open to questions. If you have any questions, our group would be too happy to answer. I will lead from the front. If there are no questions, thank you. Pleasure, please, yes. 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 No, no, that came later. First was customer base. Yes, yes, please go ahead. What's your question? Uh, our group suggestion, it's not a personal suggestion. Yeah. Uh, see, yeah, I think uh, what uh, Jeff did was absolutely appropriate, and that is looking at online. And uh, he complemented a book selling with e-books, which was Kindle. And I don't think I would be able to give a better suggestion than what job, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos did. However, I entirely disagree with him when it comes to what he has done in India as far as retail is concerned, what he is doing with dragging uh, 
Kishore Biani to uh, the Singapore Arbitration Center, what he's doing with a uh, high court, what he's doing with the Supreme Court. And I think most uh, thinkers and observers and analysts do not agree with what Jeff Bezos is doing in India. When he came to India, Prime Minister did not give him an audience. Not the industry minister, Mr. Piyush Goel, did not give him an audience. So I think what he's doing is good for uh, global audiences. What he's doing in India, especially in terms of retail, I don't think I'll agree with him. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Girish Vayan from SIT Tumukuru. And we were assigned with the responsibility of analyzing the case one. That is the great saga of uh, Marisa Carter. And the challenges what she faced were, and first of all, she was very passionate about beauty therapy, and and she wanted to achieve something, and she wanted to accomplish something in the field of, uh, say, beauty industry. And the challenges were, the first of all, she was a college dropout, college dropout, or she was a school dropout. And all of a sudden, and uh, she had to face a problem of financial constraint. And uh, to make her life worse, another one economy downfall, and made her to think too much. And uh, sh and there is a reference about the, her family manage uh, family management, and she had to manage her child. And uh, another question which we were. Uh, asked her to answer is how did how sh she has been successful and how she was successful in overcoming certain problems and the first and the first virtue which lies with uh, that Marisa was she was very passionate she was very passionate irrespective of all her difficulties and she maintained and she managed her tenacity and she was very passionate and she followed her career with single mindedness and very ambitious and uh, say she had attitude come what may I am ready to face tenacity and uh, and the most important thing which has been discussed in the case is and it has mentioned twice it has been mentioned twice that is she strengthened the customer base and she was focusing more on that and uh, she see and she was more creative even she did not uh, hesitate to take help from others very innovative her approach and she did also some kind of research about her new products and she respected values. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question uh, to this. In fact, uh, uh, we have elaborated it quite nice about the case. Thank you. But then uh, one question which arises is there is two mentioning. One is uh, the portfolio entrepreneurship. Portfolio and, and habitual, habitual entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship. So where do you put Marisa? Sir. Give the right person. Give the portfolio manager. Uh, sir, I think uh, she has used both. Uh, a combination. Like uh, when it comes to portfolio entrepreneurship, we can say that she kept on adding new products. Uh, she had a basic product and she kept on adding new products based on the requirements. At the same time, uh, her passion indicates that uh, she is a habitual entrepreneur also. So we can say that she is a combination of uh, both uh, types of entrepreneurship. Okay. So generally if you look at the source more, yes. uh, and some of the source which is given in habitual entrepreneur precisely talks about one who is, now she has already started that beauty saloon. Yes. So she was having some experience in that. Yes. And then on the other hand, when you expand something that is called as portfolio. portfolio. Okay. It cannot be combination. It can be either one of that. But that she is, has that done is both uh, our observation. We we observe that she has done both. Both are uh, done there. Uh, yes, managing both. Maybe maybe other not simultaneously, but uh, during the entire case study we see that uh, she has both the characteristics. Okay, but haven't you seen uh, an issue where she uh, had to, I mean, when she had to take a little gap in the business because of uh, she was expecting a baby? Yes. And then do, don't you see an angle of a social uh, issue here 
while disrupting her in terms of progressing as an entrepreneur? So we can't say it's an issue or uh, maybe it's it's a part uh, wherein uh, through the uh, human life cycle they, they will go through such phases so we cannot say it, it is a particular hindrance uh, so it's it's a part of uh, many uh, entrepreneurs will go through these uh, phases of cycles so we need to accept it okay thank you Very good afternoon, sir, and good afternoon, uh, my colleagues who are there for today's gathering as far as the case is concerned. We are group four, and I have colleagues who have come all the way from uh, Bapuji Institute, and then we have from SVV Harrier. Now, this is uh, third case what we have taken, and in this case, there are four sub cases, and there are four characters. Each character involved in the four sub cases. One is Ms. Shraddha Kapoor. Now, Shraddha Kapoor, her traits basically in this case is one: one is she is courageous too wisdom oriented. Now she had joined two, one, two reputed media houses, Times of India Group and CNBC. And then while working, while working in this organization, she, uh, she found that the entrepreneurial stories are not covered. It's not covered there. And being a woman, uh, she just tried to brainstorm and tried to understand why is it not covered. So it was just a kick which she got. And then she, she said that, why can't we do some of the stories, which is entrepreneurial in nature. And there were sizable people, uh, even, even, even during those times, there were, uh, there were you know, entrepreneurs, whether success or failure was a part of life. But at the same time, why is it not covered? Let us try and address it to the larger audience. And therefore, when she tried to invite people to share the entrepreneurial journey, okay, people started reading it out. People started reading it out and this became an outreach to a larger audience. And that itself made her to think very entrepreneurially. And that's how she came up with, um, you know, a content writing, you know, uh, which was named as Your Story. And this got a very larger outreach. Many of the entrepreneurial success was being shared under this one platform. So there were almost 70,000 stories, record breaking 70,000 stories which were covered under this. And that's one of her journey as an entrepreneurial success, she says, and she narrates here. That is one. Two, I'm all sure, I'm, I'm sure all, everybody knows about Baiju's. Who's Mr. Ravindran? Baiju Ravindran. Now, you know, how that entrepreneurial journey started? He is just a commoner, just like us, or rather we would say it as an ordinary people. It was just that he's an entrepreneur by accident. Three of his friends wanted some guidance on cat. And somehow he believed that he's good in certain areas, whether it's quantitative or some kind of logical reasoning, or for that matter, even general knowledge. So he guided those friends, all three of them he guided. And when he guided, he spent good amount of time with them, tutoring them, telling them, just like how one or the other person sitting in this audience who guides their friends, their, you know, their students and all that. And luckily, all those three people where he guided, they all cracked cat and went into IMS. So that actually again is some kind of a, a kick which he got, I would say. And then there was some kind of, you know, um, in a contextual which went into back of his mind. If that is an instant, then why can't I guide millions of people, those who are aspiring to join the premier business schools? And that is how in terms of preparation for JEE, NEET, UPS and Baijus, that's how that entrepreneurial zeal came, and then there is a creation of Baijus. So this is another story uniquely. And of course, nowadays you see a lot of uh, advertisements on the TV as a medium. And it is, of course, doing very well. And the recent time, he has also acquired one or two companies. Third is 
a story of Mr. Sridhar Vimbu and he belongs to Zoho Software Company. Now this gentleman, uh, he's coming from a, a, a very humble background. His father, uh, his father was working as a stenographer in Chennai High Court and his mother was a homemaker. But with his utter dedication and preparation, you know, he went into Princeton University and he obtained his electrical engineering over there. Now, going to the western part, I mean, when you're going to an US-based institutions, getting educated over there, his horizons was broadened. Okay, when you're interacting with people, when you're looking at an ecosystem of US where there is a lot of welcoming of, uh, you know, such ideas, and uh, uh, something which we could work it as a business venture. So that's how Zoho Software Company came into picture in 1996, uh, which focuses mainly on custom relationship management and web-based business tool. And, and you see, this company has also created records. It has almost 40 apps, and there are 45 million users worldwide who subscribe to Zoho. And it is called as Zoho One. So again, a, a story of an ordinary who became an extraordinary human being when he uh, went into United States. But of course, the value system what was created by his parents during his growing is that made him highly motivated to secure. Okay. And then finally, if I come to the last story of an entrepreneur, that is Kailas Katkar. He is a Maharashtrian who belonged to Rahamidpur. And he belongs to, in fact, his venture is Quick Hill Technologies. He's working, uh, of course, he's a chief executive officer. Now, in typically the Maharashtrian based family, you'll see the entrepreneurial zeal is little lesser because mostly people prefer working, okay, either serving organizations and all or going to Mumbai. But here is a man, and again, he's coming from a very humble background. His father was serving as a machine setter in Philips, India, okay, and he had two siblings as well. So, how did his journey start in the year 1991? He started off as in a small room that is boot traps radio and calculator and computer printer. So, this was some which he did, uh, starting his business into a very small room, trying to look at you know what could really work, what could really work, and how it could really work. And then, uh, from there onwards, I see little synergy between Mr. Narayan Murthy and his story. But from there he synergized and today his business is into 60 countries. Okay. And that's how his journey, you know, and his uh, 60 countries and US predominantly being one of the major servers at the same time Middle East. So these are four entrepreneurial stories of entrepreneurs and they're all coming from a very uh, humble background where they had no, nobody into the business world. But all these four, if I have to attribute success, it is their utter determination and I to look for a wider perspectives. At the same time, the horizons which they were built, these are the three things which made them successful. Thank you very much for your patience listening. Yeah. You have a question. Sir, you, you have uh, suggested like uh, so many entrepreneurial uh, success uh, stories which according to is a more sustainable business out of these four? See, as far as the sustainability is concerned, sustainability is a very big term, terminology. Okay. Because in business, you always have success or failure. Yes. However, but in the longer term, huh? your opinion in the longer term. Yeah, my opinion in the longer term, those businesses which are keeping pace with the technology and innovation, they could sustain. Because if you look at, these are all technology oriented business. Whether it's a, your story, but if you look at Baiju's also, it's technology. Technology is a platform. And if you look at even Vibu as well as Kailas, they're all technology oriented. And in today's entrepreneurship, we have to be highly innovative to sustain them. And if they could do so, they will surely sustain. So and if you could choose one of the four, which, which one would you choose? I, according to me, all are the best. All four are good. And uniquely, because they're giving you some studies, which you can really relate to. And then, of course, you can, uh, you can build up as a... You know, as an entrepreneur, this all four stories become crucial and successful testimonies which we can look for. Next group, please.
good afternoon all we are from group 4 uh, so our case revolves and over around continuous building and development uh, and also responding to changes there are uh, two uh, very critical cases which we need to analyze uh, the first case is uh, all about amazon uh, in fact other group also managed to say that they also uh, uh, said on sim so uh, the first i mean continuous building and development uh, uh, here we generally try and talk about uh, assessing uh, amazon as to how it transformed and adapted to present market scenario by uh, investing in research and development with specific reference to predictive analytics uh, which is of course uh, relying on present uh, trend and uh, helped uh, businesses to grow as well uh, the risk involved in this uh, case uh, focuses on uh, uh, jeff bezos being able to take the risk uh, and uh, which uh, was not tested back then but he managed to get to the line and he was successful uh, he played with the business model which never existed back then uh, that was one of the uh, major uh, usps which uh, did work in his favor a new technology adoption is something which uh, we can uh, uh, work out with this particular uh, case the second is uh, about nokia uh, so uh, nokia failed to play with uh, new technology when everyone was talking about new technology they did not risk themselves to go ahead with uh, smartphones which uh, apple and samsung were uh, able to price catch and uh, uh, make a road through for themselves uh, and more importantly nokia even didn't take the uh, first more advantage they uh, probably uh, uh, as we analyze and we go through they went uh, with the concept of marketing myopia in a lot of importance to uh, the products and not looking into the other part of it uh, that is in terms of the service and probably the futuristic part which uh, others uh, were able to do uh, then uh, <coughs> not responding to marketing opportunities was also one of them so uh, this is about uh, nokia and uh, nokia also failed in this case because market leaders they did not adapt themselves to market dynamics as i already told their market share uh, depleted and uh, slowly wiped out and uh, that is why uh, they were not able to cope up with the situation so these are the risks involved in the case with respect to nokia and uh, thank you so much hello thanks all the groups not that some of these characters or some of these companies are not known to us or were not known to us but the whole approach of discussing these uh, cases was um, one to have the group unified on a few thoughts and to share that with others and also to bounce off some of the learnings from these cases as in how they have adapted to different uh, changing market uh, scenarios changing ecosystem dynamics they haven't they have what they lost what they won what they gained is something that will give us a kind of a overall perspective of what entrepreneurship means to different people in different settings so it can't be a one size fits all kind of a scenario however this gives us a lot of learning i'll just give you one example uh, before we wind up for this session we we talk a lot about the handling sector the weavers we talk a lot about them and uh, there is a at one point there was strong stiff competition from china in this handloom sector so the handloom from east india if so tusser or uh, so let's take the example of tusser tusser from jharkhand and chatisgarh tusser sari uh, would cost about say average 6 to 7000 per sari made by the women weavers of chatisgarh and jharkhand china used to give that same replica the same design same uh, thing for about 1500 so here was a case where the groups wanted support because they they didn't know how to respond to that so there was a huge um, movement in that sense if i may call it so by the non profit sector to gather all the materials all the pricing get some uh, sari packets which were uh, sent from china and take it to the government and the government took it up at a higher level with the foreign uh, you know uh, trade uh, 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 commissioner with china 
and uh, eventually the sale has been stopped of particular tusser uh, quantity and quality. So that has stopped but what has not stopped is the inroads of other markets, uh, China uh, inroads into other handloom uh, weaves of different parts, other parts of India. So what I am trying to tell you is that whenever we are looking at a policy, uh, they have the requirement, they know the market, but they are doing in small packets and not at a uh, bigger scale. So they are not able to supply to the market, the demand is more than the supply, etc, etc. So they are suffering at the end of the day, they are not able to do anything. And Yes. Very much profitable now. They are at that. I will not. I mean, three years they have not. Hardly they have moved three x. So that's not a. So they are so much immersed in the processes that they fail to see the outcome. That's when you love playing, getting addicted. You actually get addicted to the game. Gratitude of being a human being that you have a chance to accomplish something. That's the basis of entrepreneurship. Please have the gratitude that you are the only species which has the chance to accomplish something. So there is no way we should think about failures and that then get ourselves pulled down. That's not the approach of entrepreneurship. I'm again saying we need not be unrealistically optimistic, but at the same time we need not be pessimist also. Because if you write from the word go, if you if you think that this is not going to work or there is some doubt in your mind, then there is a long way to go and we need to kind of go back to the drawing table and start drawing the project again or maybe go to some other idea. Nothing is more remarkable than this. So micro failures need not result in macro failures. Lots of examples in this. Micro failures need not result in micro failures. Diagnostics today is a big business after COVID. Before COVID, there are a few cases where I have been involved. They were not, do and we were supporting them. They were not doing well. And uh, in the process, we also didn't do well. But there was a, a problem with outreach. There was a problem with how you, so there are many, um, uh, you know, intricacies in this involved which needs to be taken into account. So there are micro failures at every point. Say for example, the person who is going to your place to collect your samples in the morning. How do you get trained paramedics? How do you pay them well so that they are not poached? Poaching in this industry, diagnostic industry is pretty high. So there are many issues. How, how, how you maintain the hygiene and the uh, cleanliness? How do you maintain all that to avoid infections? So I am just giving one example of one industry, there are many examples like this. So micro failures should not result in macro failures. In the, those cases what happened was these micro failures pulled the entire operations, I mean to, the, to actually uh, kind of self damage the entire program. And as a result there was large scale macro failure, so it shut down, don't want to do that. And also another example, um, urban company, urban company, it was earlier urban clap, now it is urban company. Urban company provides support for your day to day needs like house cleaning, uh, electricians. electricians, plumbing and all of that. Uh, so quickly I will give you an example before we break uh, for lunch. Uh, one car uh, plumber from a remote village goes to Gurgaon. He only has a mobile phone. So he starts attending, so he goes to offices, houses for attending all the uh, plumbing requirements and gradually he starts giving his mobile number to a few others, then a few others. Then he takes a group of plumbers, young guys, not plumbers even, to Gurgaon, train them up and tells them that this is my phone number. If I get a work, I will give you a work. So if you get a work, we will give it. So almost like a MLM kind of a thing. And today, he is probably one of the biggest plumbing entrepreneurs of the world. He is now shifted to Dubai. 
he started this on a simple mobile phone not even a smartphone so this is the essence the spirit the core of entrepreneurship if you want to go beyond your template your framework you are welcome to do that but you should do it you should take the first step and this has to come out in the nurturing thing that you mentioned that's such a powerful word no no i am saying it as a different example this is the essence and this is what we need to do in that incubation center or a facilitation center whatever you call it this is what is the requirement today thank you so much and we'll convene again probably after lunch for the next sessions thank you so much thank you for the wonderful session sir uh, we break for lunch i think 20 minutes enough for lunch so the lunch is served at the triangle there on the right so we break for lunch and come back uh, post lunch we'll have a quick photo session there itself so when we'll we'll plan there itself and have a quick photo session and then uh, gather again over here right the next session is on change management sorry yes please uh, no i think people would like to go to the washroom and all that so probably we we break and then have the photo session later so maybe you could powder up and all that then come back thank you ಸೆಷನ್ ನಡೆದಾಗ ಅಷ್ಟ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬಿಗೆ ಹೋಗ್ಬೇಕ ಅದು ಅವರಿಗೆಲ್ಲ ಹೋಗ್ಬೇಕು ಸರಿ and the curd and thin thai syrup okay fine 
during the session you are not allowed to sleep if you sleep you are not allowed to snore and if you snore uh, you give the right to the adjacent person to the adjacent person to give you a good pinch no offenses so with that disclaimer and warning uh, i would like to take you to the next session on uh, change management by uh, ms suchita hoda she is the spouse of uh, the child of the sir whom we heard in the morning and would be hearing again later i would like to introduce her she her career spans over uh, i mean her career is spanning over a period of 21 years she has the opportunity to work with three consulting firms uh, not only advising but also some of them drivers in some of the phenomenal hr changes across public organization public sector organizations uh, namely power sector oil and gas bilateral multi uh, and multilateral organizations for example uh, department for uh, international development a world bank united nation development programs uh, large indian conglomerates small and medium enterprise and non governmental organizations she is a master in science and also done her mba from uh, xavier institute of management she has worked across states in india as well as in sri lanka cambodia maldives and thailand advising government and institutions in solving their complex hr issues she brings to you a practical experience in hr area with a gamut of uh, organizations and hence the ability to leverage this knowledge with perspectives needed in academic training and training curriculum uh, that we require her work experience can be broadly categorized, categorized into two different uh, areas uh, the significant areas are change management hr strategy and design and hr operations design and delivery she has also conducted senior leadership workshop, uh, workshops across a range of areas such as change management hr business partnering organization design future of work and a few others has been and has been invited as a guest faculty several times at iim lucknow and other corporate training programs she has been a speaker at various nhrd uh, the automotive component manufacturers association that is acma Uh, retailers association of india and sap technology conferences and as a shrm to name of you uh, with that introduction uh, i hand over the session to ma'am and i wish you have a wonderful learning thank you thank you so much and uh, i am never happy with the post lunch sessions uh, because however hard i try i can definitely sometimes see someone dozing off um, i hope <laughs> i hope i don't put you to sleep Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I have worked uh, over the years, uh, and I hope I can bring to you some practical experiences because all of you are very knowledgeable people. Uh, I am sure you are. You know, there is no need for me to tell you theories and models because I think you know much, much more than me. Uh, because uh, after institute, you know, we get into the practical world, and uh, you, you have you have the models for your reference always. but then you have to dive into uh, different client issues so one of the um, you know before i get into this topic one of the uh, beauty of consulting is that you just get a uh, opportunity to work with a lot of companies and and it's never boring because every issue is different every problem is different uh, so while you might be termed as a change management expert or a hr operations expert or whatever it is the problems in every company is different so whatever uh, you know expertise you may have uh, you have to constantly uh, get into the client issue and then figure out okay i may know all this but how do i uh, put it to use in this particular um, you know situation so i um, what i've done is uh, other than a few slides which are basically introduction kind of slides i have tried to uh summarize it uh, in two three slides of three experiences which i have had they are very large scale chain management programs and before i start using this terminology uh, too often uh, so let me just uh, get into a little bit of an introduction before i jump into the experience part of it or the you know the examples so you know from the day we were born till date we are constantly changing you know some we have changed physically we have changed our thought process we have changed locations we have changed education you know so so many things keep changing you know right from 
you know the the the, the, the day let's say you know you say innovation of fire happened to steam engine to this mobile phones which we can never let go all these are uh, aspects of change and uh, so why have we made it into such a big uh, issue change management there is a whole program around it you have sessions around it you have models around it so what is so great about it because we are all as we grow we are changing we are learning well we have learned and changed over a period of time time has helped us to you know uh, learn things in its with its uh, with its passage we have developed skills we have put it to use and over a period we have adapted to whatever changes happened now unfortunately what has happened is that we don't always have the luxury of time when you come to organizations organizations have a five if they want to go in for a change they have a finite period you can't expect it to go on infinitely and you know you have the luxury of time to adapt so what do you do do you force it on them and say man you this is what it is and you have to change it doesn't work like that you know we are habit we are creatures of habit we like our routine we like to do things at our own pace today i wake up at a certain time more or less i would like to wake up like that i would like to go to office i would like to have the same you know set of colleagues so when you start disrupting all that because of whatever the reason you may be having you know it creates um, uh, it creates uh, a sort of resistance it creates um, uh, some kind of fear um, fear is let's let's say one of the emotions so a lot of emotional factors because we are human beings we are not robots that you reprogram and we'll start running immediately it doesn't work like that uh so that's why you have to have a program a process to be able to manage that that's why it's called change management you know it's not that uh, you can completely do away with it but you can manage it you can make it less painful you can make it less disruptive and that's what usually these programs are everybody understands it but unfortunately very few organizations actually follow it uh i have worked with very large organizations including large states uh, of up of karnataka of odisha uh, you know big programs and usually there is a big change management cell but somewhere in the rush of doing things and you know trying to get things done change management somewhere takes a back seat and there are outcomes of that and those outcomes are sometimes very uh, disastrous you know you have large scale um you have strikes you have lockouts you have uh, you know work stoppages you have people leaving the organization so the outcome can be really scary so the importance of change management you cannot ignore okay so i've probably gone beyond what i wanted to say so top, primarily i'll be, sorry i'm using the wrong key um can this be which one is it actually i kept this go back go back no go back okay the two gentlemen there since you have done your session uh, i think you need to either listen or you need to have your conversation somewhere else uh, so uh, objective of, of this session i just hope uh, just a few things of what is the context of change so whenever whenever i'm talking here i'm not talking about big innovations like mobile phones i'm talking it talking about this in the context of an organization nothing so this is primarily companies small big large state whatever it is this is in the this is all in the context of organizations okay and um for then uh, uh, change management models versus reality now do the models that we have learned in our textbooks are they the ones that we follow to be able to manage these kind of change or is there something beyond it or is this all that you know this is all book and hogwash and this is actually the real world is different actually it's not it there is a balance between the two because these models have come from experiences they are not something which has been created out of nothing they have come from experiences so there is a reality to these models and how you use them how you tweak them how you change them 
So I have worked with two or three organizations uh, and each of them have adapted the model in their own way. But it has all the elements of the various, comp various different kinds of models and theories which we have all learnt in our, you know, in our textbooks. Um, there is a short one page or one slide on pandemic. Now why do I say pandemic a change thing? Because it has disrupted. It has disrupted uh, the way we work, the way we think, the way the fact that we have taken things for granted for too long. So this also is a change and this is a change which we are not prepared for. Nobody helped us to program management this change. It happened and we had to deal with it. And we had to deal with it, with it ourselves, yes, with some help from the government, from other you know, from other organizations and primarily by ourselves. So how has it impacted organizations? I'm sure you all must be reading about it, but a small perspective on that and some learnings on this. So this is primarily, as I said, what has changed is that it is a deviation. For those of you, who just to set a context, just in case this is not a subject that you are familiar with, uh, you know, it is a deviation from our routine. It is out of our comfort zone. It is not something that we are used to. When you drive every day to office or you go somewhere, uh, you are dealing with change all the time. There is a car moving here, there is a person on the sidewalk, there is a child running, a dog here and there. That is all change. But you still navigate through it. Now you say that, you know, I do it out of instinct. It's not instinct, you are skilled because you have the training of how to drive a car and you have been doing it over and over and over again. So most of the time, you have the ability to steer through the traffic without even thinking because you know it becomes, uh, it's like an automatic thing and you look at the traffic and you are able to navigate. It, when the problem happens is when you are taken by surprise, when you, it is not something that you were prepared for, that's when the issue happens. So team management definitely learns skill, uh, has the need for certain skills. I'm using these words because these are the basic tenets of chain management. One of them is skill, having the right skill. Um, so it brings out a lot of emotions and these emotions are not usually positive emotions. Most people have fear, they have a sense of loss of control because you know, I know where to sit, I know who is my boss, I know who is my subordinate, I know where to go every day and what to do. The moment you take out these things and you come to a place, you say today you have been changed, your seat has been reallocated, your colleague is no longer this colleague, you have to work with some other person. That's when you start getting jittery to say, okay, what has happened now? Why, why do I have to work with him? So these questions start. So I'm saying this in a, con a very small context. Just imagine if it is a huge organization. Your whole life is disrupted. Our lives are spent mostly at our workplace. And when your workplace gets disrupted, then you feel as if your life is disrupted, right? And um, of course, then you face uh, resistance. You don't want to, don't want to do it, and you. You know, you you resist it yourself and maybe you talk to 10 other colleagues also to say hey, what is happening, you know, why. So that is also a trickle effect, you know, you, ha you have resistance inside you and you create that fear also without even you knowing that you are creating fear, you chat among your colleagues and 10 other people are also afraid of what is going to happen without knowing it. And um, yeah, it's true that you can't stop change, it will happen. If an organization has the need to change, it will change. And it has to do, if it, if it doesn't, it might either disappear or it may fail or there may be significant losses. Uh, so the only way is to evolve constantly and the change process helps you to do that. Um, these are some of the uh, areas where uh, change in an organization happens. The first one um, is organization restructuring. Is it something which you are familiar with? Then I will not so. When you are going through a restructuring completely, you know, your designations change, your leadership changes, um, your, once your leadership changes, they will want people to, you know, do different things. It happens all the time in our, you know, even in our own governments, you see. It's a type of restructuring. Today this minister, tomorrow someone, someone else is coming. Bureaucrats are getting reshuffled. Similarly in an organization because there is a need and the restructuring could be due to anything. It could be due to expansion in markets, it could be due to um, a whole new team coming in. It could be due to many reasons why the restructuring happens. Mergers and acquisitions, these are supposed to be the most complex of change management or change issues. I have been in some of them and uh, it is usually very long, very painful 
and uh, it takes a lot of time because here you have two two organizations right you have one which is there and then you have the other either merging or getting segregated so there may be two posts and one person right there could be limited number of designations there could be limited number of roles there could be new technology which you don't know you are going from sap to maybe oracle in that organization um, there could be a completely different way of working pay package salary packages could be completely different so when you are merging them or this taking or you know separating separation is still a little easier merges are more difficult because uh, you really have to find space for everybody it is not always possible because you know two when you have uh, two roles and five people how do you manage them how do you uh, manage people who have come from a certain level or a certain salary band to somewhere uh, the salary is very different the performance parameters become different you know you were assessed in x y z way and now you are assessed in a different way so all these issues start coming in mergers and acquisitions um, outsourcing and shared services now i don't know how are you well informed of what happens in outsourcing and air shared services so um uh no but what is the larger context of outsourcing actually this is a huge area i'll just some yes yes it, they do that and sometimes shared so sometimes uh, it in a larger context here what uh, sir you gave the example what happens is the one or two departments happen when it happens in a very large scale then it causes issues now for uh, let me give you an example of uh, let's say tata okay so tata steel so tata steel has hr in its corporate it has hr in its plants it has hr in its um, let's say sales offices across the country now what they say is that we want to get many of the hr processes into one place and only those hr processes which need to stay in one location let's say something which has to do with unions where you need a conversation or which is very local specific which cannot be done without a personal interface we will leave it there the rest we will pull it into a shared services you are all aware of these call centers right so shared services broadly works a little bit on that kind of principle also where the repetitive task is pulled into a uh, into a, into a centralized area so let's say um, you have qu customer queries so instead of one customer calling x and then another place and another place they pull it all into one centralized place and they have standard questions with standard responses similarly let's say internal processes like let's say performance appraisal now what happens when you fill up performance appraisals in different different places uh, there is a hr person who is following up okay fill up your appraisal form it has to be given again all these are pulled into the central place and somebody from the center will give these calls but the actual process of filling up and you know get guided that happens at the location so this is a this sounds easy but it is a massive process because every hr process and typically there are 19 to 20 hr processes then they'll for each process you'll be having 30 40 sub processes and then you'll be having tasks so you have to go to task level upwards to see which you can centralize so it's a very cumbersome process and the what happens suppose you are there and you have 10 things that you do i will take out three things from you and say this will go to the shared service this is what happens because those three things which you are doing we feel that it is not necessary that i need 10 people doing the same thing in 10 places i can pull this to, so if you are doing follow ups i will say why do you want to do follow up i will take this out and i will put it in a centralized either i outsource it or i keep it in house that's a different question this is also all of them are some sort of restructuring only if you want to say it i'm just trying to put them under categories just to make it uh, give a larger example so what happens is sometimes so you may feel that i used to do 13 things now after 13 things i'm left with seven because some has been given away to some agency some has gone to the center and so on so that also creates a lot of issues and when you do it on a very large scale it is a problem because people feel that half their work is gone it's not true they do something else but the initial fear is that my work is gone right 
um, large technology transformations. Most of you must have seen, I mean now technology is part of life, but let's say 20 years ago when uh, technology was introduced, let's say even in the government, there used to be massive fear, you know, jobs are going to go away, the computer is going to do everything, we are going to, we are finished. Why is that fear there? Because half the people didn't know how to run programs or use the computer. The fear comes because lack of your skill. You don't have the skill to do it. You have not been trained at that point in time. So you are worried that your job is gone and nothing else, nothing is going to happen. So that is then. But even now, when people shift from one type of software to another, there is a disruption. Because you know, you are not necessarily comfortable. It takes time uh, to do that. So these are some different types of uh, um, you know, restructuring in many ways or different way of working which disrupts people's, uh, you know, day-to-day -day working style. And these are the various things which can get impacted, I have already mentioned. You know, your location can change, the process of, earlier you used to do something, uh, you know, in a particular way, now you have to use a, you have to invent something earlier, you used to do it on pen paper, now you have some software, now you have to learn the software. You for many days people used to use two files, they used to keep one for writing and they used to do the same thing on the computer because they were not confident that this computer is going to give me the right information. They don't do it anymore but that was how they started out. Uh, job roles, so all these are different things that can change in a change management perspective. These are typical questions which, which come to your mind, will I have a job? That is the first question, you know, uh, is my job going to go away? Or is my job going to change into something completely different? Uh, who will I report to? Will my title and status change? But it is not just title and status change, it is also your social, you know, um, status also sometimes changes with it. I, we did something for an organization which had many layers. So the designations were also like that, you know, deputy manager, assistant manager, vice president. And then they went to an organization where it was totally flat, just two layers. So everybody was called some analyst or something like that. They got a shock of their lives, you know, what will I go back home and tell that I am an analyst or I am this, you know, so that's also a problem because you were, you have this title which, which is a part of you, you know, you go and tell that I am vice president this or that and then you go to this organization which is having nothing, it is just one or two layers, maybe a manager something and maybe one other designation. So those also can become issues. If, uh, you know, so you will have to create layers, otherwise there will be a problem there. They had other ways of differentiating, but designations were limited. So they may say A, B, C, D, but that was all internal. You know that this person is analyst A, but the outside world doesn't know. The outside world still knows the person is called an analyst. So that also becomes an issue, you know, your role. And of course location. If you are supposed to do something in some other location which you are not used to, you are not posted there earlier, it is beyond your comfort area, then also it becomes a big issue. Okay. So, for those who are not familiar with, you know, typical change, this, thing, this is just to show that usually this is a pattern which is followed. Initially there is a, sometimes people say, oh wow, you know, we are going to this very big organization, let's say there is a situation where a much bigger brand name has come and taken your organization. So there is a euphoria, oh wow, now I will be called this because everybody knows this, now this company which I work for, nobody knows the name. So there is an initial euphoria is there to say maybe management is going to pay us more because of this change and so on. But if the management has not communicated anything to you, then the fear starts coming in to say, okay, what is happening? I am not aware of what is happening, I only know what I have read in the newspapers. So there is fear, there is uncertainty. Um, and most of this happens due to lack of communication. That is the key in change management is that if you don't communicate, you create all this. So if you are not at every stage as you have information, if you are not telling your people, they will make their own answers and they will have their own thoughts and they will communicate to these kind of thoughts to other people which is not necessarily the best of attitude. Um, some people say that I don't want to be part of this, before this happens I am going to leave and go away because I don't know what is going to happen to my job. Some people hold on and they say that okay, whatever it is, this, this organization I have been working for the last 20 years, I will not leave, I will fight it out, I will see what happens. So there are different kinds of reactions that you typically get. Then you adapt 
and then you have commitment. Now the longer this stretches on, the more difficult it becomes for the organization to reach its goal. So when I talked about, you know, whether it is having phones or whether it is uh, adapting to any kind of change, you have time. Here usually there is time bound. You have to finish this in one year or seven months. You can't go wait for eternity to allow this to happen. Then it will never happen. So what we are talking, so these are the only two theoretical slides I have. After this it is all experiences. So uh, there are many models. If anybody wants, there are reference of many models. I will not go into the models, but one of them I am just showing you for reference is that typically this is how the dip happens in terms of a chain management process. And what we try to do is to make it faster, quicker, and the dip should not be as much. So slow and making the process very painful for everybody because the longer you stretch it, the more painful, the more uncertainty, the more chances of loss of people, loss of your productivity because if you are not uh, happy with the organization you will most likely try and you know not do your work properly. If you are an unhappy employee you will not work properly you know you will always be stressed. Quick. 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 I mean try to make uh, to quickly come out of that curve and move up the ladder in terms of trying to change rather than allowing it to linger for a long time. Okay. These are the three examples I have kept in mind. Depending on time, I will I will share some of these. The first one is the demerger of the government-owned electricity board. Any most of you would have heard of this, right? We are all living in a situation where this was there. Well, when it started, it was the first of its kind, um, and this I'm talking about is way back in 1995, yeah, 96. Yeah, this was yeah. Same with everything like. Orissa state, it started with Orissa, so it was Orissa state electricity board, uh, Andhra Pradesh state electricity board. So I was there in four or five of these kind of restructuring. I will take one because most of them were similar. I um, will start with the first one, uh, Orissa state electricity because I saw the entire process. In Karnataka I saw one part of it then you know as consultants we move on and there were others who came and took it. Um, and of course, some of the learnings we had in Odisha State Electricity would we try to implement and not make same mistake. The maximum mistakes was made there because this was just a massive, massive restructuring process. Um, I have tried to depict in it in some way. I don't know whether it is helpful. But primarily it was something like this. You had the generation, distribution and transmission companies under one umbrella, whether it is KEB or it is Odisha State Electricity Board or APS, whichever, whichever state you want, that is how it was. Okay. Now what happens in this situation is that you had employees, there were some people in the generation, there were workers and there were officers. Now let me take the officers, the people who were the officers or the gazetted people, they could move across these three. So today I may be posted here, tomorrow I may be posted in a distribution company. I can also be in a transmission part of it. Okay, So my location could be entire state, right? That was one of the things. Now if I, um, you know, salary grades and bands were of obviously like the government process you have, uh, you know, slabs and you are tenured and pay scale. Yeah, you have pay scale. That, uh, you have these confidential reports which is the performance parameters that they use and you move on every year assessment will be done and based on that you move to the next level. So everything is time, primarily time bound not necessarily performance bound. Okay. Now comes a situation where there are huge losses uh, because of this. Also there is a lot of issues around accountability you know everything because each one used to say that okay because of this the loss has happened. So they said okay we must fix ac accountability and this model has worked in other countries or whatever. So let us go in for this change. Lot of funding happening from World Bank, from DFID, everybody coming and saying okay let us do this. So what happens? This organization is split up. There are a lot of, uh, so I was part of the group which was handling the HR but there was financial teams, there were commercial teams, there were other teams also. What do they do? They work out that how can this company be divided into generation which is a separate entity, 
transmission and then you have this distribution. Now distribution was for this technically they wanted to privatize it in some cases they managed in most cases they didn't. But each distribution company they had a smaller area so that they could have more control on the consumers of that area. Now that itself was a massive exercise. Now this communication had to first go out to the employees. Now that, that was a big thing. So what happens? The fear of the employees is that today I am here, tomorrow I can go there if I want to. But now if this happens, you can't move out of generation. If you are in generation, you will be in generation for the rest of your life. If you are in distribution company 1, then you will be in distribution company 1. You can't go to company 2. Right? And that was one big fear that you are restricting my mobility now. Now the fear of if you are coming here to these distribution companies and this gets sold to a private company, then again fear is there. Now all my government pay scale, my protected salary and everything is now going off to a distribution company. You don't know whether they are going to, I mean as an employee, I don't know whether they are going to pay me better or worse, right? In my mind that my, it's a protected salary, it's going to go. And a distribution company, if it's a private company, they will put their own performance management systems into place over a period of time. So that these are the thoughts, many things were put in place so that this didn't happen. But these were the fears that they had, that if I go here, then what will happen? So all this was there. And who were the stakeholders? The stakeholders was government, of course, employees, public, they were also getting affected by it, the donors who were paying a lot of money to get see that this happens and employee unions. There were a lot of employee unions uh, in different places sometimes, in some, some places they were very very strong like in Karnataka this, uh, the em employee union was very strong. So if you are not able to convince them that you know help us to be through this process you will not be able to move an inch anywhere, you cannot do it. So you had World Bank and I was just mentioning it was primarily in most of these cases it was World Bank and DFID, most of the cases. In some cases it was also ADB which was also involved, these were the things. So yeah, so these were some of them were loans and some of them were grants. The loans you had to pay back, grants were given as uh, infrastructure grants. So, um, so what happened, there was a change management team which was put in place and the biggest thing that was put in place was the communication team. Now what happened in Orissa actually was that the communication team did a lot of external communication. So they told people that you, this is going to happen, you know public like consumers that this is going to happen, you know things are going to be tightened up, you can't be cheating on your electricity bills, you have to be more careful, distribution companies will make sure that you pay up. Um, so that was the communication which was going out. Not necessarily communication internally was happening. So people who were getting impacted had 110 questions which was not getting answered uh, you know properly. In the process, uh, process, so I was part of the consulting team and in the team we had also a very large number of field people who we had hired so that they could be on location and not just stay centrally somewhere and give you know give the details but what happened was these people were attacked they had issues where the uh, stones were thrown on them there was a car which was set on fire in one place uh, they broke their offices so they, it turned into vandalism at one point and why was it happening because they were unsure unsure in terms of the people who were uh, you know what is going to happen uh, and the second part was of course so the employees won't do it themselves but they would instigate you know the consumers to do it to say okay today you are getting these freebies because of us tomorrow some company will come and take this over see what will happen after that so the consumer also if he's a big industrial fellow he will, he will send his goons and then they get beaten up so this these were facts this is what happened actually so there was uh, this process started stretching too much so there were two things which we learned from here so they did a lot of communication not necessarily in a united manner because communication, the key to it is that you should have one standard communication. So what you are saying, you have to say it again and again and again in the same style to the same bunch of people. If you are going to say something and I am going to say something and he is going to say something, then you do not you are not communicating, you are miscommunicating. So there is a way to do this, there is a process. So you plan out a communication strategy and say, okay, this 
at from this month to this month this is going to happen and this is my communication who will communicate this team uh, will communicate here that team will communicate in the fields and this so there is a plan which is laid out there is a presentation which is created or a communication material that is created which goes out to everybody people are invited to the offices and that communication is given so i personally in karnataka uh, not in orissa but in karnataka when this was happening uh, we had to go to different different uh, you know places uh, districts to communicate that so we would take our union uh, because for all our meetings we had our union people together because if they were not happy we could not do that communication so we would take them along and of course the material was also discussed with them they would do the presentation uh, they would tell what is going to happen mostly questions which you know which can be misinformation to people if you don't know so they would ask only if they needed help they would ask us to pitch in for it otherwise they would carry out the communication and standard stuff what is being told in bangalore is being told here also it's not that i'm saying something here and you're saying something else there and that was that worked better than what we did in orissa which was a disaster in many ways we had everything but we didn't do it properly we had communication we had and we had a massive skill training center because the distribution companies which we they which came in they had their own technology which they would have bought in and different things so we wanted that the people even the lineman who is there you know there was issues like uh, one lineman can do 15 kilometers now the new company will say that why why 15 kilometers he should be able to do 30 i will give him a bike he should he can do 30 so he will give him something and now that guy has to learn how to do it. so small small changes uh, suppose you see sometimes electricians uh, they come then one is holding the ladder one is climbing one is fixing the ladder one is giving instructions so that is how typically they would be doing uh, one of them came and said no we will give you folding ladders you just you know like you see in the west you plug in everything here and one person comes and does everything no 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 that can't be how can i i need an assistant you know so small small things because everything counted everything mattered that means you're changing my style of working i had three people to support me now you're telling me do it alone you're asking me to carry one ladder instead of two people holding a ladder and walking so there every so i'm telling you the minutest issues we forget about larger issues like pay salary and you know those kind of things so those we sorted by talking to the employees having a union agreement it was a tripartite agreement between the government and the unions and the uh, the, the board itself to say that their salary will be protected protected to a point till a few year, for a next whatever 10 years or 5 years or something by which bulk of the people would have retired but the new people who will join will join as per whatever that company puts in place so that is how it was managed because if you say i'm going to change your salary tomorrow it's not going to happen because you've all these years you have worked under thinking that it is a government protected company and now suddenly you're taking away all my facilities so those agreements were put into place and uh, there was a another massive thing which was done which was called an option exercise now what is this option exercise so everybody all the employees not the workers but the officers they were given this option that either you can join the, join this option of um, being protected for next 10 years under this service regulation or getting a higher salary and better opportunities and join the new uh, uh, service regulations which is being so that option was also given so some people joined this some people joined that Pardon? We are not VRS. VRS is of course was there. What I'm saying is option of joining which service regulation because your service regulation governs everything: your salary to your transfer to your uh, performance managements and everything, right? VRS was also there. VRS was a separate scheme which was running. So those who didn't want to stay on the board just took VRS and left. That was also happening. So these were all multiple things which happened. Um, in Orissa, it was a very long process. It was the first time it was being done. Too many uh, stakeholders, too many. All the rules and regulations, whatever we have, we are learning and all the models we applied everything. But I won't say it was done in a very systematic because there were too many variables and too many moving parts and too many uh, political 
influences which was constantly being put there. So, you know, so what happens? You draw an organization structure. So, all these employees who were here, now you have four distribution companies. I have to draw four organization charts. And of the people who have opted to come into distribution company, so there may be 50, there may be 30, I have to fit them into four different organization charts. And I can't pick and choose by name. I have to do it anonymously because otherwise I'll be told that you are, you know, you are making, you have favorites and you have put this one here and put one. So we used to actually do a random uh, generation and just, okay, civil engineer, uh, superintendent engineer, you have three posts, one, two, three. Who is going there, we don't know. But they won't believe that, no? They will think that we, <laughs> we have still in It's a very hard job because you have limited, you have now splitting everything into these four, that one and so generation transmission they would stay with the government that was for sure so people started saying that we want to go to these two companies you don't want to come to distribution so we started having shortages here people didn't want to come to the because there was a chance this would get sold off so this was the process and it was a massive change exercise two things as i said are very important one is communication Second is training. There was a massive training center which was set up to say that even if you go to these, this thing, you will be equipped with all the skills that is necessary to be part of this exercise. So that was one of the learning is that you have standardized communication. Take the unions along with you. Take the people as much as possible when you are drafting. Don't don't draft something and say, okay, no, this is what you have to agree to. Take them along with you as much as you can and have an, it is a difficult process but you know you had to go through it otherwise this can't get done. So that was one, I mean there were lot, many other stories behind it, I will run out of time. Um, this is on a shared services, I am not sure how much if this is a more, that is almost ancient now that is 26, this, this is happening even now it happens with organizations. So this is an example of shared services where you have multiple systems and you want to rationalize it okay so for, let me give you a, a context of this uh, institute suppose you have two institutes like this okay you have two institutes right so you have one in pune so you have two institutes like this all the processes in hr let's say are common so you have performance management you have recruitment this is for your internal recruitment you have i'm not talking about your students you have a recruitment for your uh, people, you have um, you know other processes like health, welfare, benefits, compensation, all these are processes and these are there in both the institute, the one in Pune also and one here also. Of what I will do is I will say that you know we are duplicating a lot of things. So I will pull some of these processes to a centralized system or I will give it to some outsourced entity. So they will manage these two things and you are left with some 10 things which you have to do. So the larger the organization, the more complicated. If I do it for Reliance, it is a massive exercise. If I do it for Tata's, it is a massive exercise. Um, we did it uh, in Anaka, we did it for Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson is present almost in every country in the world, 100 and uh, whatever, 53, 54 countries it was there at that time. So when you do it for them, it is a huge exercise, it took us 5 years. And we had to do it in waves because we couldn't do everything together. So you would say, okay, Latin America, this, this, this country, first wave. Asia pack, second wave. So it had to do, uh, processes were done. So it's very, very complicated, very time taking. Teams were more than 100, 200. And then you had local teams because I don't know that let's say, let's say PF. Now somebody sitting in the US who is running this doesn't know my PF processes here, right? I will have to tell them. So, you understand? So, so if Deloitte is doing, let's say Deloitte or PwC or whichever consulting, so it, I was in Deloitte then. So, if they are running it from the US, they need people in every country for that. Because if I am a Deloitte India or if I am a PwC India or any consulting firm, let's say, let's say consulting A. So, if I am doing it, I will have to help that team to be able to do the processes for. They can't do PF and they can't do pensions and they can't do those this thing so i will have to help them from here so just imagine the scale of the of the work uh, somebody will be in cambodia somebody will be in bhutan and i am rationalizing the these processes which are uh, which comes under employee benefits 
for all these 150, 53 companies. Massive change, right? So we did it for Amex. These are big, big companies, and their presence is not just in, you know. Uh, so uh, these things, uh, so when the when we did it for these companies, so these are also massive change exercises. Again, same thing, same questions. So what we do in some of these, we run a change uh, assessment. So before you start a project or you start a change management, you want to know the pulse of the people to say, okay, let's see how afraid we think they're afraid. Are they, or is there a willingness to change, right? So you run something called a change readiness survey. It gives you a little bit of a understanding of how resistant will they be. The answers or questions are uh, written out in such a way that you get a pulse of the people, right? And you keep doing that uh, change readiness survey periodically throughout. So suppose it's a five-year program. Every year, three times after major milestones, you run that to see, okay, is the, have they moved? Has the positivity come become better? If not, why? Then you have these large sessions like in big halls like this too ask questions, please tell us why you have this issue, what are the problems, what is your fear. Then we try and bring that back to the board and then they try and answer that. So again here is communication. So if you communicate right, chances are that you will be able, otherwise you will have to bulldoze it and it is not going to help, you will just have mass resignations in some cases, it does not work that way. We have seen wherever it has failed, it has been failed because you have not equipped people with information, you have not equipped people with skills. You have told them your job will change, but you have not helped them to get into that job, right? If you have not helped them, then they will obviously fail in that job or their productivity will dip because they do not know how to do that work. They will take time to learn. So these are two things you have to anticipate beforehand. The reason it all looks very obvious when I am speaking, ki, okay, this is very simple. It is not simple because this is my priority as a change consultant. That is not priority for everybody. For the finance guy, it is to close his books or see how it is going to, you know, uh, impact the processes. For somebody else, something else is more important. The deadlines are not always driven by people's reactions, right? The deadlines are driven by the organization's objectives. That is why these things just fall apart. And things do not happen the way they are supposed to happen. Um, the same example. Um, I will tell you a little bit about this. This is a UN organization um, and this was the country office of that UNDP, you, you maybe have heard of this organization, UNDP, it is part of the UN organization. So um, the natural calamity which I am talking about is the tsunami which had happened, right? So when tsunami happened, these small, smaller countries like Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Maldives, not Cambodia, Maldives, um, they had a, um, so these UN organization, UNDP what they have is they have donor money and they run programs in that country, whether it is for livelihood, it could be for natural disaster. It could be for the environment. So they have five or six programs, five programs I think heads are there under which they have some money and they do programs in that country. Now what happened is when the tsunami happened, they got a lot of funding to spend in that country for tsunami related disaster work. Okay. So what happens in their kind of system is this money is different, that money is different. So this has come temporarily because of the calamity. This is our reg regular thing which we have to run as an organization. So if I have $100 to spend on my regular program, now I have $500 to spend on all the disaster that has happened because of the tsunami that has happened. Okay. Now if you don't spend that money, that money goes back. So if you, they give you its time tied. So you have to spend this by December, this, 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 otherwise the money will go back. They have very limited people in the organizations. They have, you know, let's say 30, 40, it's a small country, so small staff. So they were not, and at that time they were changing from whatever system they had into SAP and they were struggling, they couldn't, uh, they hadn't yet learned the SAP system well and they had to report on SAP, they don't know SAP but they had to report back on all this money which is coming for tsunami related work back to their uh, head office. So one is I don't know how to do SAP, I have this $500, I don't know how to spend it. And I have only 30 people who I have, I have to manage this. So what happened was, there was a fear that they will not be able to use all this money effectively. So 
uh, we had to help them to set up another structure, a temporary structure, which had almost a replica of a lot of these things here as well. Right? So, suppose they had program 1, 2 and 3. So, there was program 1, 2 and 3 here also, but this was for tsunami related work. You, have I explained myself? So, if I am doing environment program there as part of my regular job, I have here environment program 1, but that which has been impacted by tsunami, hence I have to give it money and I have to allocate and account for it. So, what happens is you within an organization you have set up two we were mandated, we were told you do this and we said it can result in a disaster. So, there were constant conflicts. So, politics also comes into this. So, you have one country of his head who is trying to do both the things, trying to say that I am balancing, but they were, they were at loggerheads with each other. So, they would say, no, this is my work, why are you doing it? They will say, my work, this, this one has, to, has the backing of the so, this temporary office has the backing of the head office in the UN head office to be able to use that money. These guys do not have that backing. So, he keeps threatening them and bullying them saying that you know I will go and report this. So, there were a lot of issues. This is also change management in a very different twisted style because you are having to run two organizations. You have a goal, but your goals are different. Their goal is to spend the money which has been given, which is whatever money extra they have got. Theirs is their regular job that they have to do. Now, they had a uh, restriction in terms of numbers. They can't go beyond a certain number. So, they had to continuously ask for help from these people and they didn't want to help. Right. So, I don't have 30 people. I need two people from you. Please give me. A, no, I won't give you. I have a lot of work. I cannot give you. you find your own person. You have a lot of money. Go hire. No, we are not allowed money for hiring, we are allowed only to spend on the program. So, there were again internal conflicts. So, as one of our change roles was that how do we streamline and get them to work together. Now, I don't want to see your face, but I have to help you to work. It's very hard. You are dealing with people who are of a... So, when there is a budget session, you are setting the budget for the, for the country, they will have their own budget, they will have their own budget and this person will be trying to say that okay, you know, let's have one team meeting together. They will have the team meeting but then they will go their own ways. So, there were a lot of emotional issues. Now, nobody talks about these things when you do chain management. You think it's an Excel sheet and you put people there and they will start working. doesn't work like that. So, this was in many ways, I would say this was not a very successful um, you know, we were sort of, sort of caught in the middle trying to do this and that and ended up doing it ourselves because we didn't get cooperation from anybody and we had to finish our stuff. So, this was where there was no communication. If there was communication, it was very superficial. Nobody wanted to really say what they wanted to do. Actually, if you see, there was no threat to anybody, but it's a perception. If you're not communicating, see, this team will go away. It's not going to stay there for perpetuity nor will they take over their jobs or anything, but that too, it is the temporary loss of power. Earlier I report everything, now there is this guy who is also saying I also want to report. So, my access is gone, I do not feel happy about it. It can happen to anybody, if, if, if I put a situation like this here, it will happen here also. If I take away your, your, your sense of power and your sense of uh, achievement and your sense of, uh, let us say, closeness to, your cent to the center or the central authority, uh, this situation can arise. So, I would say this was this was one of my examples. I always say this is what happens when you do not have the team talking to each other, nor are you doing anything to, I mean, we are outsiders, right? As consultants, we are outsiders. We can't, beyond the point, you can't do anything. You will have, you can help, but that is about it. You have to do it internally, bring them together. So, this was a case where I thought neither was there communication. Neither was the, oh, these people did not know how to run SAP, they could not do it. So, we had to run it. So, it ended up on our table which is not the nicest thing because we will go away. After that, who is going to do all this work? So, you need to equip them, you need to run training programs, you need to teach them to do. So, that was also done eventually, but it took a lot of time and this was a case where I thought the entire process could have been handled uh, much better. Uh, so, this is one example and the last one I would just like to share um, is, okay, so these are three examples we gave one is shared services. So, these are some of the tools that is used typically 
stakeholder mapping when you say stakeholder mapping it's a heat map you create to see that who are your stakeholders and where do they stand uh, who can you take along with you quickly who are the ones who you have to communicate more so let's say in the first situation i knew that i had to take trade unions along with us we had to do that otherwise we wouldn't be able to move who was on our side the donors were initially the donors were the only people who who were wanting to push this nobody else was happy but as we moved slowly into the process after one year or so we saw that that had also changed so in the wanting to go through the chain there were more people coming in there less people on the resistance so this heat map helps you to uh, see how you frame your communication who do you communicate more do i need to speak to my employees more at this point because your change strategy is also like a how do you say like a program milestone 1 milestone 2 and reactions are different at different milestones right so you need to communicate for that particular milestone right so the second is change readiness how ready are you to change so these are information to help you draft your strategy that's all so these are different sir you don't have to use all of them you can use one or two but if you do this you are not uh creating a communication strategy out of thin air you have some backup data to say that i will so let's say for one of our uh one of our projects we said okay we will do this in a town hall because these people are not computer savvy they cannot if i send them an email they can't read they need verbal communication so how do we do it we call a town hall so massive town halls you know 300 400 people will be there and somebody has to communicate to them so where it can be done in a smaller office it was done in a small where it was done through emails we also had small things like mugs and uh, you know small uh, you know memorabilia is given out to say that you know this, so that you always have it in your back of your head that this, this is happening this change is happening this is going to uh, you know these things will change so that was also done um i don't know whether i mentioned one project out here no so there was this one uh, other project which is which uh, uh, i don't think i mentioned here so these were two technology companies both based out of bangalore okay very large companies um one of them started out on the shared so i wanted to say it in the shared service journey one of them started out on the shared service journey one of the first in the technology firms who wanted to do that they asked for help they said okay fine but we but they had so many political issues even to go to the first step of communication so we must have drafted that one page to say that we are embarking on this change so some i'm not kidding it is must be at least 10 times we must have read that because everybody wants one okay this word this person will feel bad that word this one will not take it nicely so we kept changing words and cues and commas and r's and that message never went out finally so the project go we did a small like a it was like a 15 20 day just to assess whether this can go through or not because it's a large company we didn't want to rush into it without testing the waters we couldn't get that communication message out because each time we sent it some it would go on hold because they felt that they can't share it with uh, their whichever team they were sharing it because somebody is going to feel besides if you're going to feel bad with this one page there are some 100 messages like this which will go out if you're going to be sitting on this each time this will never happen so whereas for the other company which is also bangalore based also very large that's a multinational company as well so when they did it the first thing was there that they got the leaders together the people who mattered you know in this some 10 of them this is going to happen these are the people who are supposed to help us do it this is the timeline they are a precision company that they are famous for their precision precision instruments this date this this has to happen this communication has to go so sit with the team work it together find out what you want to share and share it you we followed the principle of whatever they wanted to do on time messages were drafted together sent out everything was done it it went so smoothly communications messages went trainings were conducted town halls were done um email messages were uh, sent out everything any possible way of the films were shown uh, to them and anything that is expected in a change management process was done and it happened 
the day we were told to leave, that day we had to leave because it was done. So that is like a dream project come true, which doesn't happen usually. And it happened because, so <laughs> I am not going to tell names now, because um, when it happened, it was, uh, it was a very pleasant surprise. And uh, we give this as an example that, you know, if you do things right, and if your leadership is with you, and they say that this will happen and we will do it together and push it through, it will happen. And people also were, uh, you know, uh, they, they were much more recipient to it because they had seen similar changes in the past and it was always for the better so that resistance levels were a little lower, I think, because management had done a good job earlier so they had a lot of faith that they won't mess it up this time also. So that went very well. So that, that was, again, two technology companies, very large. But one couldn't even go, it didn't go, they dropped it that year because they couldn't get that message out. Then they tried it again after two years and they might have, they did it internally this time, they didn't call anybody. So however they did it, they did it themselves after that. And uh, coming to this, just a short uh, message here, that pandemic was a change which we didn't expect, right? You can't prepare or train or do anything out here. Um, Many good things came out of it, many bad things came out of it. We learned that we can manage without our office. We learned that we can still work virtually and get things done. Not always the best way to do it, but it can be done. It's not an impossible task. But many unfortunate things like, you know, um, uh, finding that people were having mental health issues, they were feeling lonely, because everybody is not necessarily having a family to support, uh, support them in the process. So those were unwanted. Uh, outcomes also uh, for many women uh, had a, a tough time during pandemic when a research was done because they had to manage home, child, family, work, everything sort of started resting not only in India across the world. I think they had uh, they had a major uh, issue there as well. Uh, so these were multiple things which happened out of uh, pandemic. Now what what happens is when we talk of future of work, uh, we always thought that you know technology is coming, you know AI is going to take over, uh, robotics is coming in, and we as human beings have to find ways and means to be working in this new future. Now in that whole concept, what we completely forgot is that we are human beings, we are not robots. Okay, we have a different way of working. So all these theories was always that technology is here in the center, workplace, human beings or employees, leadership, everybody is around it. But actually that is not the concept which is going to work as we are seeing. It is human beings who are at the center and all the others have to fall into place because we are much more fluid, we respond much more. Now if it was not you know, our skills and our way of adapting and it would have been AI who would have been responding in a different way. Because we respond differently, we are more fluid. We use our potential, we use our skills and we find our ways to navigate through the problem, right? So I think the future of work is to not just manage to work with AI, but also to unleash our own potential. I think employees will more and more look into that, that let us equip people and they have much more ability. Madam, this uh, government electricity board example, what you give? Uh, what was the duration of reinforcing change which took? So it took almost four years for you.
And nowadays, uh, there is a lot been written on uh, change ambassadors. Change ambassadors, in fact, uh, there are, in fact, uh, they also call it as a protagonist approach, wherein, uh, wherein some of the functional heads in the peripheries, where if there is any positive protagonist who can permeate the change management towards the uh, functional level, to its teammates, and eventually towards the bottom level. So, do you practice it? You try to identify some change ambassadors and you incorporate them. Okay, and one last question. 
there are two schools of thought generally in change management which we see one is of course the resistance to change and then how the interventions approach and another is from top down approach like if your clientele gives you this is what we expect we want to introduce this as a technology and you know they have an overall plan then you tend to work out from the top to bottom approach but generally what's your approach when you are trying to advise your client Okay, thank you, ma'am. What, what does it mean for you? Sustainability of the environment. Why do we, everyone today is talking about sustainability? Everyone. What, what does this actually mean? Carbon positive? Positive? Okay. You are talking about the future? Carbon positive. Carbon positive. Carbon positive. Sustainability. So he is worried about the future. That's why he is worried about sustainability. Anyone else? What is sustainability for you? Development. development should happen, shouldn't happen. Development. Zero carbon, carbon neutral, water, good quality water, good quality life. So essentially what it means is that we are doing a lot of damage, that's why we are suffering and hence there is climate change, hence there is all kinds of problems in our lives, day to day lives, we have natural disaster, we have coastlines eroding, we have sea waves rising, we have no good water available for our lives, we have microbes now attacking us, so we have different kinds of morbidities. So what is development if development is taking us backwards? What is development if development is 
landing us in more problems. What is development if development actually makes a dent at the GDP? If GDP is the measure, we say that our annual growth rate is X percentage. Now out of that annual growth rate X percentage, if our disasters take us back by 4 or 5 or 10 percent, what is the net development that we are giving or we are leaving for our children, for our next generation? So if we live properly today and leave something, uh, leave something for the next generation, for them to survive, that is sustainability. Very simple. We want to live properly, we want to grow, we want to develop. When we talk about sustainability, please keep in mind that we are not talking about anti-development. We are not talking about issues like we should not have development, we should not have industries, we should not have uh, highways made, we should not have um, SEZs, no, we should not have all this. No, that is, that is not a perspective that we are going to talk about. At least I am not going to talk about that. I am going to talk about responsible development, responsible industrialization, responsible mining. If we are talking about mining, if we are talking about how mining affects our forestation, how because of mining our soil quality goes down, how because of mining our people are suffering in coal mine for example, a lot of suits and that, that the, the dust. So suspended particle material, SPM. So you must be reading in the newspaper, SPM in Gurgaon in Delhi is probably the highest in the country, 435. Right? So something like that, that actually is killing us. If that is killing us and we say that we will not have development, that will not take us anywhere. This beautiful road from Bangalore to this place would not have been there if you are only stuck on the idea that we will not cut trees and will not have roads. That is not the answer. That is not the answer because we will, we will have to grow economic uh, from all, all economic parameters. We have to grow because there are number, number of people. We have to grow because we are the youngest country. We have to grow because we have to be the economic superpower. That is our, our aspiration for the country. So we have to, growth is unstoppable. We cannot stop growth. Let us be very pragmatic, very practical. But at the same time, the human life, the quality of human life should not decay, should not go down. And we should not be going to the hospital because of growth. So I have, I have shared two articles with you. One talks about the aquaculture in Andhra Pradesh, East Godavari. And another one talks about black paddy. So this suit that I was telling you about, is in a tribal district of Orissa where because of coal mining the paddy is black. There is so much of deposit on the paddy that they are eating paddy, black paddy. This is not the, there is another variety of black paddy which is exotic, which is very high quality, high priced. This is not that paddy. This is white paddy turning black and it is affecting the lungs directly. And there are so many cases now increasing because of the morbidity due to this. That is one example. Another example is aquaculture, rampant aquaculture in East Godavari. So how many of you have seen um, the aquaculture, the physiculture pro projects in uh, Andhra Pradesh? Have you ever seen? There are huge tracts of uh, fish culture, ponds, big ponds. In all of these big ponds, so there is a lot of fish culture in Andhra Pradesh and that goes to different states. They, they provide fish for different markets. They are one of the uh, country's biggest fish producer. Yeah. But what happens, sorry? Coastal Andhra, East Godavari. But what happens is the nitrogen and the phosphorus that is left behind destroys the soil and there is no other uh, crop that can be uh, produced there nothing else nothing else grows there and people develop asthma and breathing problems copd that's a breathing problem pulmonary diseases so what happens then what is this development we are talking about hence 
today in this presentation i'll take about 30 minutes from now i'll take you through the tenets through the basic introduction of esg i'll not go very technical for obvious reasons because this is our first session and this is a very important aspect for all of us we have to live development has to happen and we have to live properly humanly so all of us please give this a very patient hearing and a deep thinking please go back and i'll give you a homework also when you go back why i'm why i'm so intensely talking about esg is because esg in one thing where I have given a lot of my time working with different corporates and working with the communities also to understand what's the net return that we get out of these industries. What is this net net thing are we getting from these industries? I will give an example. Um, in southern part of Odisha and northern Andhra Pradesh there is a whole belt which is bauxite deposit. So all the big international majors have come and set up their aluminium plants. One, there are indigenous communities, I do not call them tribals because that is very discriminatory I think. So I will call them indigenous communities. There are indigenous communities, they have been one displaced. Why they have been displaced? Because they want to do mining there. So the one of the basic norms of mining is that after mining you have to fill that up and fill that up with vegetation. You plant, so you do uh, for forestation so that it will get back its soil quality and it get back its vegetation. What happens is they dig that, they take out the bauxite, they leave it open. Now if they leave it open that does not help anyone. The, the water, ground water table goes down. So there is no ground water. Okay? There is no water to drink. The drains or the, sorry, not the drain, the water bodies around, the canals and the natural streams dry up because bauxite deposit takes a lot of water. And number three, what happens to the people there? They are in any case displaced. In the name of corporate social responsibility, CSR, they are given a colony. They are made to stay there, they are given houses in lieu of their whatever their habitation they had which is now destroyed. They stay there with more pollution because of the factory industry, no water, no vegetation and in the name of CSR again they are given some projects like kitchen garden project. So, so when they are given a house they are also given a little plot of land with that house. I am giving you this long story so that you will understand from where we have to view ESG and understand it in a way which affects all of us. Otherwise it will be only a definition in a slide. So I do not want to be um, theoretical. Now when my family is displaced, I do not have water, I do not have food to eat, what do I do? I either become a migrant laborer or I do not know what to do. I just while away my time or if the company decides to take me as an employee then I get into the company. But I get into the company if again if I have the skill. I get the skill if the company again decides to skill me. So this is a cycle which is never ending and it has been happening since about last 15 to 20 years in this particular location I am talking about. So why ESG? Again coming back to ESG. If the company could go by the ESG set norms and framework which is done by the government, which is done by UN agencies, which is ratified globally, globally all the companies go by that norm, adhere to that norm, then this will not happen. This will be minimized and we want that to happen. We want bauxite industry, aluminum industries to grow. We want more people to get employment but we want our earth to be protected for the next generations. This is our whole idea, hypothesis, 
basis premises of ESG so far. So far this is what I wanted to tell you to lay the context for this session. Now uh, you give me that. Uh, yeah go back. No the first line no uh, yeah then. So what is this sustainable business how it has come to uh, this shape who are the major players involved who did this who did this ESG who was the first one see where we are now UN SDGs are driving a global commitment to sustainability right all of you are aware of SDGs all of you are aware of SDGs what is the full form of SDGs Sustainable Development Goals. All of you are aware of this. Now earlier we had Millennium Development Goals. Now all countries for all humanity to have a better life. Right? So you have a sustainable development. That is why these goals are there. Under these goals you have, you have to, uh, so one of the goals is to reduce poverty. One of the goals is to have a safe uh, uh, society. One of the goals is to have uh, uh, minimized gender bias. So there are, sorry, yes, there are 17 such things which have been decided universally to do this so that we lead a better life. Don't go so much by these acronyms and all these jargons. Eh? I'll, I'll try to, so SDGs are our goals which, which all of us have sat down and decided for a better life. While, so while SDGs are driving a global commitment, we have COVID-19. So COVID-19 is a microbe attack of small organisms. And there is, a, there is a study which says that going forward, microbes come from different, so microbes can come from animals, so animal to human transmission is going to increase in the coming years. Vegetation is going down. So our immunity is also going down, hence the microbe attack on us is going to be more and more furious, more and more severe. While this is happening, inequality is driving activism. There is a lot of inequality, lot of inequality, lot of conflicts. So you have Me Too, you know about Me Too. You have Black Lives Matter, Share Action, so all these are drives, campaigns or uh, uh, you know society revolutions, small revolutions which are reactions to different inequalities, rich poor, skin of the um, uh, um, color of the skin, uh, you belong to a different economy, I belong to a different economy, you belong to a different faith, I belong to a different faith. So all kinds of inequalities are rising. I am giving you the broader perspective in which we are living now. We cannot be silent, we cannot be uh, thick skinned, we cannot be uh, absolutely you know um, unreactive, unresponsive to all of these. This is all happening around us. It is not about any theory, it is happening in your life and my life. So, why inequality is happening? Climate change is driving corporate strategy. All this is happening and yet climate change is bothering us, is hitting us every day. Siberia today has black snow. Today, Siberia has black snow. Why? Siberia has black snow because of the coal mining, of the mining sector. Oil rigs are driving the communities haywire everywhere. It is not about India, it is not about only bauxite and aluminium, it is about industrialization in, in total. So within the next five years all investors will measure a company's impact on society, government and the environment to determine its worth. What does it mean? When we have business, a business has many stakeholders, shareholders, the government there, the community, the immediate community, primary community the secondary community. So when, when there is business, 
there is the entire universe coming together to that business all kinds of stakeholders are there you just can't ignore one for the other you can't do that you're not supposed to do that because everybody is involved in this if everybody is involved in this how can somebody do business by harming one of these factors you cannot do business now if you cannot do business what is the enforcement how to who says you cannot do the business so there are two ways of looking at it one you can have civil society activism we are the people who will go who will say look you are not doing things right you have to look after our people or we'll shut you down that's one way of looking at it another way of looking at it is to be the arbitrator between the society civil society and the government say that look government wants this you want this and the industry body wants this let's sit together and determine adhere lay down that if you are going to dig three mines then you have to close the mines after the mining operations are over you have to give more water you have to give a water filter in the villages so that they can have uh, uh, better water to drink you can give a hospital you can do this you can do that so there are a few things that will be laid down and it can be decided for the that is the way we are looking at so today you would have shareholders who are activists in major companies the shareholders are now activists so in the board meeting they will raise objections they will say we don't for example x company wants to expand x company wants to go to public to raise money from the public for expansion of the plant when they go to public to raise money the shareholders have to give their permission have to okay that the sebi also security exchange board of india has to okay that if i raise an objection as a shareholder as group of shareholders we say that we don't agree to this because the existing plant is completely violating human norms and not allowing people to live then they will have a serious problem it has happened in many companies i'll give you examples this is the definition of esg so i'll just read it out if you i don't know whether you can see that from from a distance because of the can you see this can you read this no uh, it will cut out a lot of things that size is okay i'll read out not a problem so what are the esg risks why are we talking about esg and what are the the major components one is climate change another is environmental impacts health and safety communities board quality shareholder rights i have i have already touched upon these things so the, the all this constitute the esg risks and esg addresses many topics and stakeholders so esg represents please read this uh, paragraph carefully the company's efforts to systematically assess manage and monitor risks of material potential impact to the strategic and financial decisions of the company what does this mean this is a big long sentence But what does this mean this essentially means that a company has to be on its toes company has to be alert to the impact its business does on the community on all of our lives that's what it says and it has to be protective about the environment it has to because what is the basis of all this thinking because company is not a separate entity and it doesn't come out of the universe somewhere out of the globe it is very much in the globe company belongs to all of us we are stakeholders and company is a association with people like us so they are not from anywhere from outside the society and outside our framework so they have to adhere to our human norms that's the whole idea social norms and you would often see esg being changed or interchanged or uh, no please go back uh, 
uh, with with other uh, terms like sustainability csr public relations social investment environmental compliance all of these are essentially esg related uh, terms let me tell you something about public relations now that we are talking about it you would be wondering why public relations is there some of these companies and i work in in their uh, you know in their uh, sphere of business very closely some of these companies use their esg i am deliberately using the word use their esg as a pr tool i am so good that i am doing this and hence my company stakes or my company stocks should rise my company valuation should rise because i am doing this as a pr exercise i will not do any value judgment on this no right and wrong on this but be cognizant of the fact that some of these companies use this as their pr tool now you must be thinking which are the companies you all know we all know which are the companies which say that we are so now it has become almost a fad a fashion for all the companies in their annual report to mention that we are environmental compliant you must have seen this why do they do that because esg is important because they have to do that so we have to be a little careful here to actually determine and understand whether they actually do that or use this as a pr tool and resort to tokenism if they depend on tokenism or do this to promote themselves without doing anything on the ground it's a matter of concern otherwise i would not get into the negativity of it there are many other things around this around the pr thing why do they talk so much about no i take care of the environment i do forestry i have planted 500 trees no all those things if you have actually done that then what you do is you measure you assess regularly you assess how much of carbon dioxide has been sucked in due to your forestation do you have the report how much of pollution has gone down because your chimney now is a upgraded chimney which doesn't you know uh, spew uh, dust and smoke do you have a measurement if you have a measurement then please show that that's what government and un is now asking every company and it's going to be mandatory that's what i'll talk in the next slide i've already told you this go, uh, go down i'll come back to this later this is what government is asking what is this is in environment under environment what do you want to so energy and greenhouse gas scope emissions how much is being emitted how much of uh, it being avoided how much of it has been reduced solid waste management water consumption and withdrawal 3r what is 3r practices excellent sustainable sourcing extended producer responsibility do you know what is this epr now in coffee packets do you see sustainably pro uh, procured coffee do you you haven't seen that so what it means is if for my chocolate bar if i am procuring cocoa from some some place then from end to end including logistics and supply chain everything has to be environment friendly then i can say that it has been procured responsibly and that is epr extended so it my work doesn't stop if i give you cocoa to your factory and then so it's not like that it has to be the entire value chain has to be environment friendly life cycle assessment every i have already made so at every point at every juncture you have to have the entire life cycle assessment whether it's going the right way or wrong way as per the norms social employee well being workers health and safety training human rights social impact assessment gender equality csr activities and details of beneficiaries 
you all know I am sure that CSR is mandatory. Under CSR, now you have to give a report which says that in Harihara, Charudat has been the beneficiary who has been given this benefit under this scheme for this much of money, for this much of value. Everything has to be mentioned. Earlier, okay, this was the CSR program and this was done for 10,000 people in Haryana. That is no more acceptable. You have to give all the details. And uh, it is a very interesting story in CSR. The first CSR white paper was drafted by me for India. So under that, what we saw was many companies, they almost about 60-70% of companies had spent a lot of money in roads. So our question to the authority, uh, there is a CSR authority, we asked them, if roads would be made under, built under CSR, what would the local authorities do there, government? So CSR should not be misunderstood and misused. So there, there, there were no clarifications. Now there are complete, it's, it's, a, it's a very clear thing now and it has been explained very properly by Ministry of Corporate Affairs. That is the line department for CSR, Ministry of Corporate Affairs. So under governance, you have anti-corruption, anti-bribery, conflict management, retention policies, remuneration policies, stakeholder engagement. How well do you manage your company, your business, your people to deliver environment and social benefits? Simply explain. Can we go back? This is the trend from when we started and where are we now today. In 2019, ESG reporting was started by MCA. I was mentioning to you, um, MCA. And so the, you can read that, I don't have to read this. So today, business responsibility and sustainability report, BRSR, is mandatory for industry. And I will tell you what's the trend, what will happen in the next 10 years or 15 years, what would happen. So if this is the trend, have you read this? Can I go to the other slide, next one? Go down, yeah. If this is the governance and the regulation now, today, what would happen next? BRSR, Business Respons Responsibility and Sustainability Report, to emerge as a single source of sustainability disclosures in India. So from next year, we would monitor sustainability in India. Suppose tomorrow in a UN meeting, we are asked, what is your sustainability? We say we are very sustainable. We say we have a CSR program. We say we have BR, BRSR. But the body will ask for a report, consolidated report. This will be the only indicator of where we are on sustainability. So we are trying to standardize the BR, BRSR, the sustainability report, and put that in order for all the industries. And this will be, so have you heard of CII, ASHAM, FIKI, all these state bodies? They will also be given the responsibility of consolidating all this. It has already started. It has already started. So it will serve as a base document. Bloomberg says by 2025, which is about 3-4 years from now, investments with high performing ESG metrics will go up. It will it'll go north. It will rise. Because sustainability ESG report is going to be the critical thing for the uh, business development, business growth of any corporation. Societal needs and business opportunities will uh, cope together by tr uh, transform the way companies craft. This is what I have already mentioned to you. So ESG is going to drive the company's business development processes, strategies and it will also drive the stakeholder management going forward. It will not be easy for non-ESG compliant industries to operate anymore. Days are, days are not far when every company would be questioned on their ESG report, on their adherence, on their compliance to ESG norms, environment, social, governance norms. 
what next these are the two thoughts i wanted to share with you effective compliance frameworks in place for non financial disclosures so what does this mean non financial disclosures means there are many reports what i what i try to explain you like example is csr report example is um, i'll give you one concrete example logistic companies the truck companies big logistic companies huh? they have a uh, huge number of trucks and they use a lot of fuel lot of uh, you know, fuel and the combustion from these uh, trucks um, creates lot of pollution so the truck companies typically they mention these many trucks have been um, have been made to go through puc the pollution check and that's the only previously that's the only document that was given to prove that the engines of these trucks were or are efficient and they are non polluting because they have a puc certificate now going forward we will ask them for example under this uh, esg what's your carbon footprint how many uh, trucks have you converted to ev electric vehicles mm, how many trucks uh, have you uh, i'm just giving a few examples huh? how many truck drivers now uh, don't have morbidities don't have diseases don't have problems because of long hours of driving we are coming to that level we are coming to those details now and there is a company there is a startup today in the morning i could have mentioned about that there is a company a startup which is mumbai based now they have a office in uh, operations in delhi their business is they will give you drivers so that every 6 to 8 hours the driver changes so if a truck is carrying materials from say visakhapatnam to mangalore and if it is a stretch of 3000 kilometers no driver would be allowed to drive for more than 8 hours so at every petrol pump or at every so they have decided those nodal points where there will be a driver ready fresh driver ready and this driver will get down so he will go back so they, they have made those arrangements and a new guy so the whole idea is to have the trucker a very healthy life and not put the truck and the other people in uh, uh, traveling on the national highway into any kind of danger so this is the kind of impact going forward we will be looking for all of our actions and that includes all of us also as individuals that's the level of details we'll be going forward i mean we'll be looking forward to in this and i think esg will also be mandatory in that sense mandatory as in um, it'll be um, non compliance will be taken as a serious offense there are certain uh, rules and regulations laid down by minister of corporate affairs now but those are not as stringent as they should be or we desire them to so that's the way forward and that's what i think esg is headed to in the future over a dozen companies including reliance industries vedant jsw hdfc have gone have, have tried to be carbon neutral right have tried to be carbon neutral in the next few decades and some of them are recalibrating the business to hit net zero emissions so they want to control their carbon emissions and they have to do that there is no other way out and if these corporations have to exist they have to change the way they are doing business and we have to change the way we are also consuming their products why do you think coffee packet they are writing it's uh, responsibly procured because the days are not far off when our children will say i will not take this coffee because 
the people who are collecting coffee has not been taken care of their hands are burnt there are scratches animals have been hurt the days are coming and we'll be soon looking after all these things very closely affecting all our lives this is all i wanted to tell you under i have just mentioned this but you are all aware of this so you already mentioned uh, 3 hours and epr and all of that so this is all i wanted to share with you under esg to do two things introduce esg to you tell you what are the trends today and what's the future how does the future look like for all of us and more importantly i want to end with this it's an appeal to each one of you please take active interest in what is happening around us in the environment please don't keep quiet if you see any product that you are consuming is not adhering to the norms please raise an issue please write there are many consumer protection forums government has laid down many many uh, avenues earlier there was nothing there if you open the internet you have thousand windows to help you in this please write please be active please respond we have become with the power of internet we have become more democratic let's be let's use that for our own benefit let's be selfish for this planet we have to be selfish it's our planet please think what you're going to leave behind for your children thank you डॉक्टर सुधांशु आपका खुद कलेक्ट करिए डॉक्टर वी एस पाई सर आपको भी देना है डॉक्टर चेतन हिरामठ डॉक्टर राजेश कुमार सतपति गुतप्पन लादवन के सुहास सपना मैडम नहीं है अनुपमा जी जया बोस में यस युवराज जी नहीं है क्या किया सर डॉक्टर शिवगंगा मैरेज सर प्रकाश एस पसंद नहीं है विटल आरटी मिस्टर विटल आरटी विवेक शर्मा वैशाख सनत
it. Uh, I request Dr. Pai to uh, yeah to <laughs> present a memento to ma'am. And Sudanshu sir to Charudas sir. Yes. I request Dr. Agraj to present the word of thanks. It's my proud privilege uh, to get a word of thanks uh, to our Charudat Panigrahi sir. Uh, I have noted down some of the very important points that are thought provoking for all of us. It, is, uh, it started with no books in, it is all through sweat and grind. Because throughout the session, we could understand uh, the efforts taken and uh, the hardship taken in shaping some of the things for the nation, not only the nation, for the whole globe. Apart from that, some of the things I have, I kept on noting gratitude of being a human. I think micro failures need not result in macro failures. These are all very thought-provoking things that I kept on noting. That was for the first session. Second session, in fact, it was on change management as there also I noted some of the things. Change is an order, order of the life, but we have to be prepared uh, ourselves by unleashing human potential noted from Madam's uh, slide. These are all very thought-provoking things, but we have to put all these things in action and I uh, assure that from here onwards the thinking will go on these lines. And the last session, but a very important session for all of us is being responsible for a responsible development that is on ESG. And also the, uh, uh, it's a very important thing and again uh, it is an introduction about the trend and the future of ESG that we are going to implement it in our uh, curriculum also, sir. That, that is what we can uh, tell from this particular uh, platform. We are implementing some, uh, we are getting it as one of the subject also from this year, ESG. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In fact, we, uh, we stopped the process and we thought after this interaction we will develop further yes and the last one is to be selfish for the planet that is again one of the very important thing which was stressed upon and we should be doing it in uh, it as a our life practice so thank you very much for all these things and uh, I, I, and i wish uh, 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 coming days we will be able to implement all these things in our curriculum also as well as in our life. And I extend my heartfelt uh, thanks to all colleges. In fact, we have gathered here almost 15 colleges, rep representatives coming from 15 colleges. Eight uh, uh, representatives we have from Karnataka University, Davangir University, we have GBR uh, College, Bangalore, KLS, IMER, Jain College, SJP. Uh, BIT, High Tech, uh, and GFGC, Harihar, and uh, B.S. Chanvasappa College, uh, Dhangare. And also, uh, we have here two professionals. One is uh, Shivalila Dothrad. She's a dentist, but still she could uh, drive down from Hubli to here to listen to this wonderful moment. And also, we had one more professional who was a um, lawyer. Uh, because of her engagement, she left the session in between. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, wonderful session. On behalf of management, director, sir, I extend this sort of thank. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Sir, we meet for tea at the triangle.